unprecedented energy crisis, the need for transformative solutions has never been more urgent. But within crisis lies opportunity. Welcome to the second annual Tribeca Few Facing Commodities Conference held in the heart of Singapore. Over the next three day challenges, we're diving deep into solutions, beginning with the technologies and resources that will pave the way to a carbon neutral future. This is where the leaders of today shape the energy landscape of tomorrow. Best innovate and inspire. Together, we will discover unparalleled investment opportunities for the energy transition and connect with like-minded professionals committed to making a difference. The future is not just what happens to create. Welcome to the second annual New Tribeca Future Facing Commodities Conference. Well, good morning, everyone. Lovely to have you in the room with us. Those of you early birds who've gotten up nice and nice and brightly this morning, I hope you're enjoying everything that Singapore is turning on for us, especially those of you who have travelled from quite some distance. Good morning, fellas. Come in and grab a seat. So, slightly intimate gathering this morning, Mr. Bairstow, as you come to this. Dash. Hello, Tom. Nice to see you, sir. And lovely to have those of you who are joining us online as well for the second day of our conference. Yet, my name is Christina, and it is my great honour to be your MC over the next couple of days as we learn together. It is, and also some educational matter will be shared with us today, and some panels. The first presentation this morning is, in fact, educational, and I could have done with a bit of help. Excited. Last year, I don't know, like many of you probably all had your 10 bag or two. I got my very first 10 bag last year in battery minerals, and I was absolutely went up, and then it just went <clears throat> and crashed. But I've had a chat with our first presenter about that, and he said, Cleaner, did you not realize that when it goes up there, you're supposed to jump out? I was a bit of a virgin at that one, I was just in there for the ride. And he said, No, no, get out. This morning's presentation is going to have a little bit of a look at as for battery minerals and what that's done to share prices. So how it's changed the landscape of the market. And leading us through this discussion, uh, as I mentioned, is Hayden Bairstow. Now, Hayden has a very impressive reputation. Uh, he was originally with Macquarie, wasn't it, for quite some time, and now he's with that giant Argonaut. And he's got a very impressive reputation with Argonaut. I could go through it. He's actually with Argonauts Research Division. He's what we call in Australia an influential individual in this particular field. So we're really looking forward to hearing from him this morning. Would you please welcome from Argonaut to discuss the volatility in the commodity price for battery minerals this morning, Mr. Hayden Bairstow. Thanks, Chrissy, and morning all. And uh, well done on getting up, getting up early. It's always a bit of a challenge, I know. Uh, especially being in, in the equity markets in Perth, where we, for some reason, don't have daylight savings. So if you're working in a place like Macquarie, then the morning meeting is about 7.30 Sydney time, and if you take three hours off that, you can work out what time you have to get up every morning. So well done. It's not certainly not that early, but uh, we've, uh, we'll get kicking on this. So what I thought I'd do today and, and sort of just go through you know, what, what the battery materials market's done in the Aussie market, and you obviously there's 50 companies here presenting over the three days, and just to provide a little bit of a landscape for, for where those companies are, where they've been, and sort of what, what this whole battery materials market has done to the, to the landscape in the, in the ASX in particular. Uh, so this is not a great chart, but it's basically everyone who's presenting this year and how they've gone over the last 12 months. And as you can see, it's been pretty tough. I did have to remove Mr. Rivera from this chart because when he's up 1,000%, it sort of um, you know, skews, the, skews the axis a fair bit. But, um, Certainly the uranium places, uh, names have been quite good. There's some, some good development players there. But I, I think it shows you that if you, you make a discovery that's material, 
it doesn't matter what the commodity price is doing in reality, um, that you'll just get a lot of value. But if, you, if you're sort of working on an asset that's understood, then you do become beholden to, to what's actually happening in the, in the shorter term on, on some of these commodity prices. So it has been a tough 12 months, but if we move forward to what's happened in 2024, it's starting to get a little bit better. Uh, the access is certainly shrinking. I mean, these numbers are still plenty of companies in negative territory this year. There's been a pretty strong sell-off in the first quarter, but um, we are seeing a little bit of glimmer of hope there. I mean, the, I think the, the stronger performance from last year, particularly in the uranium space, that, that sector's been continued to be strong and NextGen continues to advance its projects and it's, it's helped them be one of the better players. But we are starting to see, you know, a bit of a broader recovery across a number of different areas through base metals as well, which has been quite encouraging. And then when we look at the last the last month, uh, it's, it's starting to look better. So obviously coming off a fairly low base here, but we're getting momentum across the whole sector now. There's plenty of things that are now up and up pretty reasonably in the last sort of three or four weeks. Um, two thirds of the companies here are all up. Uh, so certainly encouraged, encouraged by all of that. Uh, and particularly the breadth, I think. It's not just lithium going up or, or base metals. It's a bit of everything. It's you know, rare earths are going up. We're seeing a, a decent recovery across the board. And, and I think as uh, a couple of presenters yesterday indicated, you know, lithium prices particularly have probably bottomed. We saw Albemarle overnight with a, with a decent spot price uh, sale. So those, those sort of negative momentum stories are, are slowing um, and in fact have turned to the positive and similar for, for the copper space. Um, I think the, the outlook on copper particularly, and I think Scott touched on that yesterday, uh, the ability for the world to make enough copper to actually undertake this entire decarbonisation of the, the global power grid is going to be quite challenging. And that will flow through to most of these battery materials in, in, in our view. So when we look to the commodity prices, I mean, this is the, the chart on the left is sort of where I always like to point people to. I mean, in general, these commodity prices are, they do benefit from inflation. Obviously, it's pretty skewed by what's happened with uranium prices and the, the low they came off. But most commodity prices, you know, through a cycle are generally pretty heading in the right direction. I mean, you can start with gold prices, which just track inflation, and they generally just go up every year on average once you smooth uh, yeah, normal month-by-month normal -month volatility, but certainly these battery materials names, you know, if you're up sort of 50, 60 percent over a five-year period, I mean, it's a pretty good return if, if, if you can roll that into the equities, particularly when you think about anyone who's producing a commodity generally has two to three times leverage to that move, so you're going to start seeing some pretty, you know, significant moves, moves in value. Um, obviously, the chart on the right, though, just highlights that uh, it has been pretty tough. Uh, in, in the short term, and that's the reason that a lot of companies have struggled is we've just had this negative momentum across a lot of the battery material space, particularly in, in, uh, in lithium uh, in the last year. So uh, that's been the sort of, the, I guess, hit, hit a peak. So we're sort of at the peak this time last year almost. So, um, you know, we're, we were coming off what was an extraordinary pricing through the back end of 22. Uh, and hence the percentage numbers look, look quite aggressive, but in reality, coming off that low and we'll start moving forward, I think we're going to start seeing a much more bullish uh, outlook across all of these battery materials. And what will start to emerge, I think, is really the supply difficulties. Mining these things, developing them, getting approvals across the globe in different countries is far more difficult than, uh, than anyone ever anticipates. I've been looking at commodities for over 20 years and you know, I harp back to 2010, 2011 when the world decided that iron ore was finished because BHP, Rio and Vale were adding tonnes in Australia and none of them hit any of their targets and these companies are basically unlimited on funding uh, and they still couldn't do it uh, and we had a bull run in iron ore for, for a decade which is still going now because the, the supply just never arose, arrived. So to think that we can do the same in some of these smaller, more difficult metallurgical commodities like things like spodumene and lithium and, and rare earths and these sorts of things and actually deliver on, on targets is arguably farcical in my view. So I think that we're going to see much a, a ongoing story of just supply disappointment pushing markets into, into uh, deficits and we'll just see continued price spikes and, and more volatility in this space as we try and increase the scale of these markets. I mean, if you look at anyone's targets for EVs and, and battery storage. I mean, the lithium market needs to quadruple inside of a decade. I mean, it's just, I don't know, it's going to be pretty hard to do. So um, it would just create a lot of volatility as expectations move around from being oversupplied for a very short period of time to, to supply deficits, as we've seen in the past in plenty of other commodities. 
So we look in the very short term, again, the start of the year has been pretty tough, but if you look at the last month, as I suggested, you know, everything's starting to go up pretty much, so it's looking quite, quite encouraging that we're starting to see some decent moves across the board, so certainly to suggest we've come off the bottom, I think that chart on the right would, suggest, would just demonstrate to you that we, have, we are off the bottom, effectively, and it's all looking quite, uh, quite uh, encouraging. I think there's a few laggards there on the right-hand side, but um, you know, rare earth still heavily controlled by China in terms of supply. They're probably the, the bigger laggard, I think, out of, out of most of this space. And obviously, uranium and iron ore had such a good year last year that it doesn't, it doesn't surprise anyone, really. They've ticked back a little bit, but when you look at the share price chart, or the, the, the chart for those commodities, it, it's a blip to the downside more than anything else. So yeah, certainly encouraging signs across the board. So what I thought I'd do, looking at the Aussie market, uh, obviously the lithium space has sort of come out of nowhere. If you look back a decade, these companies barely existed. I mean, Min Resources was a mining services and iron ore business, but you know, between, between the, the four bigger ones, they've, they've certainly become you know, quite large players. Uh, the market caps have, have soared to sort of peaked at over 50 billion combined between the three of them. And probably the interesting thing is, as you can see, they ran with the lithium price really hard. But the biggest intriguing thing, and as we get through some of these other, other slides in comparison, is that the market at the big end has been happy to look through the lithium price fall and the, and the trough that it's hit and now come out of. They've been, it's, min resources is a little bit different because it does have a big iron ore business and that's obviously been a massive benefactor for them. But in reality, Pilbara is just pure lithium and, and IGO is pretty much the same, to be honest. And they, they've also really held up reasonably well in comparison to what we've seen in the commodity price. So when you think about big long only funds in Australia that, tr that, that struggle to put money to work at the best of times. They're happy to hold big positions in these names, thinking they'll look through it on a three to five year view. Um, and implies that the lithium prices are heading back to somewhere in that 20 to 30,000 range based on where the share prices currently are at the moment. So that's, that's pretty much what you need to plug in to get the current share prices in terms of evaluation for a lot of these bigger stocks. So that, that's where I think the, the broader market still prices lithium in the longer term. Um, but when we look beyond some of these bigger ones and look at some of the smaller ones, I mean, lithium is a little bit different because we had Tony at, Az at Azura and obviously Liontown um, sort of emerge out of, no well, out of nowhere really and, and make amazing discoveries through 2023. Liontown obviously had the bid from Albemarle that came and then went, uh, but were building a pretty sizable project themselves. So the, the next leg, I guess, of, of the bigger players in, in lithium in that top chart just shows you that um, you know, it became a pretty sizable business, but those those stocks, I mean, Lion Town's obviously come off with the bid as well, but they, they've come back with um, with the lithium price. If I stri strip out anything involved in, in corporate M&A and just look at the other three bigger players in, in Patriot, Wildcat and, and, uh, and Latin, then they have suffered a bit, but again, nowhere near as much as, as, uh, as some of the smaller names, which I'll get to in a second, but haven't quite held up as well as, as some of the bigger names. I mean, Patriot would probably be the exception to that, and given the quality of the, and this potential scale of that project in Quebec, that uh, does not surprise me at all. I think it, 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 just again, a demonstration, as we saw with Azure, that if you make, as I said at the beginning, a, a real discovery of a, of a scalable asset, you will essentially become commodity price agnostic. It'll just be a question of going through the process, which is three to five to seven years, depending on where your asset is, to develop it up, put resources around it, you know, put a structure around how it's going to get into production and just go through that process. And if it's attractive enough, like we've seen with Azure, then you just get taken over by a bigger player and they put it in their portfolio and go and do it themselves. So I think from, from a volatility point of view, it's... It's always been my, my sort of view is if, if you're in the bigger names or the assets that have got real scale, if there is periods of weakness on commodity price moves or market weakness, et cetera, on Patriot share price there at the bottom in grey is a good example, it's the, they're, the, they're the entry point opportunities because the asset is still there and it is essentially a commodity price agnostic outcome. I mean, a Patriot's asset will get built no matter what the lithium price is pretty much. Uh, it's just a question of time frame and, and how long it takes to get there. But when we look at some of the, the smaller names, this is where they have gone down with the lithium price. And we look at the tops, all the small splodgermine guys in, in Oz and in Canada, uh, with uh, Piedmont and Sayona with their operating asset, Core, which got into production and is now turned off again, and then some of the smaller guys. They found it much tougher, and we haven't really seen a material recovery yet. Um, and that, I think, is partly because we do, it's not a huge institutional basis, so we're not seeing that 
longer term view of I just need to put money to work. I'm getting inflows every day, so I'm just going to hold a, a sizable position in, say, a Pilbara or Min Resources. It's probably a little bit more what you'd call hot money and retail money. So as the commodity prices fall and sort of the, the exit from these companies has been quite aggressive. Uh, more so on the bottom ones, which is um, the brine names, where they've all really struggled uh, across the board uh, in terms of where, where they were. And obviously, you know, looking at the market caps of these things, they were up at sort of five, six billion at one point last year when lithium prices were seventy, eighty thousand dollars a ton. Um, but yeah, have also struggled. And, and a little bit of that was, I guess, there's hype in the sector at the time, and it was just sort of get into anything in lithium, and it was all going up. And there's been a little bit of a a reset of expectations as to how long and technically difficult some of these projects might be, or if it's at smaller scale at a lower price environment, then you're gonna to need to do a joint venture deal with someone who's got infrastructure or something like that, which starts to shift the economics around a little bit. So these are the names that obviously, if the lithium prices start heading back to anything like where they were, will probably do the best given where they are. Um, but you do need that lithium price to continue to recover. If it stayed where it is for today, for example, for the year, I think it would still be a reasonably tough environment for a lot of these share prices for the next 12 months. But certainly if uh, Chrissy looking for another 10 bagger, uh, you're probably going to find it in something of this ilk as opposed to buying Pilbara at the top end because those names are already quite well valued as opposed to some of these smaller names. We look across parts of the other the battery material space. The nickel space has just been totally transformed in Australia. I mean, it was we had IGO as a nickel company for a while, who's now lithium. Western areas got taken over by IGO. Mincor got taken over by Andrew Forrest, Wiley Metals. Uh, so we've been left with basically we just had Chalice and uh, developing this project and nickel mines. And nickel mines is obviously the dominant player. And one of the reasons the nickel price is as weak as it is because they're a participant in the Indonesian capacity build out in, in MPI, which has flooded the nickel market and pushed the price down as much as it has. So you know, there's not a lot of options now in, in the Aussie space um, in terms of things that are in production. They've all sort of disappeared out of the market. Um, you've literally either got nickel mines or you have to move to IGO, which is essentially a lithium company. So nickel mines is basically the only game in town from a producing point of view at this point in time. But there are some development players out there that but I still think uh, have a lot of promise. You look at um, Centaurus in Brazil, has held value okay. I mean, it's come under a fair bit of pressure like most of them and and, the, and Chalice Mining, which Alex has been speaking here, or I think yesterday, you know, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's not just nickel, it's um, it's PGMs primarily as well, which have, have a similar share price chart, to be honest, in terms of the nickel price. So yeah, those, those big scale assets like that, you just have to continue to push through and develop it and at some point, the market will recognise that there is a pathway to production that's fundable by themselves and, and you'll start seeing a better outcome. So, yeah, these the smaller scale things have really been the ones that have struggled the most for mine. So uh, if you are looking for high risk, high return type outcomes, then, then I'd certainly be pointing you towards these sort of spaces as opposed to uh, the, the bigger names, which remain, remain quite, uh, quite solid. And I'll just finish on, a, I guess, a bit more of a, a positive note, which is the sectors that have just had a really good couple of years. I mean, gold's obviously not in, not in uh, the battery material space in, in any real way, but it's, it's, it's a huge part of the Aussie market. We've, we've had a big merger in Australia as well with New, Newmont and Newcrest, but it's now pushed the whole market cap over 100 billion. So as you can see, in terms of the importance in the Australian market, gold does dominate and does, does take, I think, away um, some of the equity interest in some of the battery materials space when, when things are weak as they are today, uh, because the gold price has just hit new highs almost every every day over the course of the last couple of years. So the gold sector is, is broad as well. There's sort of you know, at least 20 odd producers in Australia. So there's a huge list that you can pick from and, and provides a lot more interest in the space. And then the other area has been uranium, which has been nothing short of extraordinary. I mean, the, the market cap of this space is sort of approaching some of the lithium, mid-cat mid lithiums and gone beyond them. So it's become something that no one really looked at at all um, three or four years ago to becoming quite material. And, and there's no sign of it slowing at the moment. I mean, obviously, uranium is heavily reliant on government policy in terms of nuclear build-out. But um, you know, at this point, it's, there's a lot of supply risk around where it comes from, particularly historically, the amount of production we've got out of places like Kazakhstan. Um, so it does look uh, like a quite quite an encouraging sort of mini sector that's emerging in the Aussie space that will, I think, continue to get more and more interest, particularly as, as some of these guys get back into production. Boss has basically just started. Uh, Paladin's on the cusp. Next Gen's 
clearly got the biggest and best asset, but it's a few years away from, from being in production. Uh, but we'll start getting a few of these guys actually producing and starting to demonstrate how much money they can make out of actually producing uranium as well, which I think will bring, it, bring even more focus to, to the whole market. So volatility is there. It's, it's hard. How do you deal with it? Well, I mean, your friendly Argonaut research team puts out a lot of, a lot of notes trying to help you na navigate what's actually going on. Um, there's four of us in, in the mining space um, based out of Perth. Uh, we've got an institutional sales desk in Perth and in Sydney. I think George from Sydney is here to, uh, at the conference this week, um, who, who have a lot of close contact. The advantage of being in Perth, as we are, is that uh, you know, one of us is, is out of the office in, in, on the terrace or up in West Perth seeing a management team pretty regularly, to be honest. So um, getting that face-to-face -face contact as you're all getting at this conference is something that we do on a fairly regular basis. So. If you are struggling with volatility, um, there's plenty of there's plenty of guys from Argonaut that will be happy to give you a hand to try and navigate it. And with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hayden. I could I genuinely could have listened to that for a lot, lot longer. And a reminder that we do put those talks up on our YouTube channel. Anyone have a, a question? Because he's got three minutes up his sleeve. Stuart, is there anything from the floor you'd like to ask? All right, but you can go and speak to him more intimately in his booth, which is just inside the door on the left-hand side in the exhibition hall. Thank you very much Great. for that. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, I'm thinking I should have punted uranium <laughs> last year. Would have perhaps been a better bet, but there you go. All right. Oh, wait. Wait one second. We do have a couple of seconds. That's late. <laughs> People always ask me that. And again, it becomes, a lot of that comes to, you, to your tolerance on risk, right? I mean, it's... My number one pick in terms of what I think is the safest company to own is would be something like mineral resources, but it's not going to go up 100 percent, 50 percent or more. Jeez. Um, good Are we question. giving personal stock recommendations? I, I don't, don't know. Think so. Yeah, I don't but think so. I can't think of have to jump things that go that much. <laughs> he's, he's doing he's doing broad observations today. Thank you so much, Hayden. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Thanks, guys. All right. Some good news for our first company to take to the stage this morning. So you've got Gallant Lithium written down in front of you. There is an announcement, and I've been reading it in the last hour or two, that's come to light. It's about a sizable increase in its uh, mineral resources estimate for the Hombre Muerto West project, which is located in Argentina. And that makes it its highest grade resource estimate declared in Argentina to date. So very impressive. So this fellow is going to have a smile on his step as he comes up to join us. So what does that mean, of course, for Gallon's resource base, its ability to react to any of those uh, lithium up price upswings that we're looking for? This is their MD for Gallon. This is JP Varga de la Vega. Please make him very welcome. Good morning. Um, it's a bit cool in here, isn't it? Yeah, that, um, I never thought that I would say that here in Singapore. Well, thanks very much for attending the conference. Um, it's a pleasure to be once again in Singapore. And just looking back just 12 months ago when the, the conference um, kicked on, and I remember presenting here, there's a lot to tell about Galan in the last 12 months. And I would like to say there's a lot more to tell in the next 12 months time coming up. So. With a usual disclosure, um, I will take you into a bit of a memory lane about Galan. This is Galan in 2019, just before COVID, before you know the world turned upside down. We managed to drill at Ombre Muerto West, and um, we didn't know what we were going into. The only thing that we knew that we were next to Liven, called Arcadium today, and we will see what we'll have at, at the time. Well, fast forward five years, or less than five years, actually, and this is uh, yesterday. So we are going through our phase one development. You see in the ponds being constructed. You see in the pond number one is already being filled. Pond number two is um, started being filled as well. And what you can see in, in black are the liners being laid down. We expect to finish the laying of liners for uh, pond number two in the next uh, 10 days or two weeks and no longer than that. Um, point number three, just next to it, it's uh, almost 50% constructed. And the liners will kick on um, there again. So um, what you see in the background, just for reference here, that's a 250-bed camp and the power plant that is just sitting there. So this pond is 2.4 kilometers long. 
and we're building four of those that are at similar size. And importantly, um, from here until the first half of 2025, we'll be in production, we'll be in cash flow. And we are producing a premium product. We are producing 6% lithium content. And what does it mean? And Joe Laurie call it liquid spodumene. If you are familiar with all the spodumene that is coming out of Australia, this will be SC13, not SC6. So it's 12.9 to be exact, but I ran the 213. It's a fantastic high grade. So we got a product that we can transport anywhere that can give us a high premium of um, payability, transport costs are less than half of um, spodumene. Operating costs, if you are familiar with the spodumene narrative, will be around $350 a tonne for producing our concentrate. So not many spodumene producers can do that. And importantly, if the wall remains the same way that is today, at around $15,000 a tonne, we'll be making more, uh, we're making $6,500 a ton margin. So, you know, this is a business and we are here to make money, look after the environment, look after the community, do a bit, but uh, we're gonna be sustaining the test of time. And well, now that I've given you a bit of a journey and um, where we at and where we were, I'll tell you a bit more about um, Galan and why it makes it so different. We have, Today, an up, a resource update. We've gone from 7.3 million tons of lithium carbon equivalent to 8.3 million tons of lithium carbon equivalent. So that it's around 18% jump in our resource. Grade was maintained and actually was increased. We added a new tenement to the north, that's the Catalinas tenement. And importantly, to the north, grades go higher. So it's a, a gift that keeps on giving and the the more that we drill, the more we find, and the more that we see that the strength of our project is fantastic. And I don't want to distract you too much with things, but in a salt flat, grade and variability is really important. If you've got a cube, the distribution of the grade, as long as it's consistent, you know that you're going to get a consistent grade to put into the ponds and the evaporation. If that grade varies in that cube, then you need to start doing a lot of calculation and making sure what you extract from there gives you an average grade that goes into the plant, that goes into evaporation, and you have the product that you want. I've seen two salt flats or two projects in Argentina and actually in the world today that don't have that problem. The one is the old Livent or Arcadium and us. Great, it is consistent. And that's what we're so confident about the capability of Galan to produce what we say we'll do on time, on budget, and we are already a third of our project in, and that's been demonstrated by looking after our money, the cash that we're spending, what are we doing with, with Galan, and the advances that we're making is making good progress. And we've seen the evidence that is in our ponds. Now, the, um, the construction, as I mentioned, is going well, so more to in the, in the presentation. The operating costs are very low, and that's what I would just mention in the introduction, $350 equivalent if we were um, producing spodumene, or $3,500 a ton in our phase two, but around the $4,000 for, for being conservative, a price of $15,000 a ton, payability of a lithium chloride concentrate for being conservative again, use 70%, that leaves you with a, a payability of $10,500 a ton, cost is $4,000 a ton, Therefore, six and a half thousand dollars a ton margin. And that's something that not many companies can do. We've been gifted with, with a high grade low impurity project and allow you to leave this room knowing that Galan, when it comes online, will print money. Now, it, um, I mentioned phase one. Phase one is the smallest one of the four phases of development and they will have a table showing that next. In phase two, uh, we are already done a DFS, so the engineering is done. Phase two, we have already submitted the permit, and I just came back on uh, last Saturday from Argentina. The discussion and the approach that the mines department of Catamarca is giving to all lithium projects is fantastic, and especially with us, because they're seeing what we're doing. We're following every step 
that we promise it will do, and they want to give us a permit for phase two within the shortest time frame possible within them. What does it mean? We believe that by mid-year, this year, or give or take, we should have construction permits for phase two. Now, the exploration upside remains open, and we haven't touched Candelas, and we haven't touched Candelas since 2019. There is an upside there. Grade is not as good as Ombre Muerto West, but it, the inventory remains untouched. So we'll go eventually there, and we'll, we'll have a remaining upside for, for Galan. Now, no project is a good project if you don't have a team to execute. And when you see this, you see a team that has experience of executing. If you see seen our releases on project update, you can see the advance that we do month by month, pond by pond. These guys, the executioners, are the same guys that built pond for SQM for years and years. So this is a small footprint of what they've done. These are the guys that are expert in executing this. And the team that, behind, that Galan has behind is pretty much SQM 2.0. So from the execution, from the operation, from the hydrogeology, from the commercial side of things, from people in the ground, we have the experience. And that is something that not many juniors in the leasing sector has. We do have it, and we are gonna demonstrate in time that we can produce and be a cash flow um, positive company in, within the next 12 to 15 months. So with that, where are we located? That's a map of Ombre Muerto West. By the way, this presentation is online. You can download this at your own leisure. And you can see Arcadian in yellow, and that was live to the left of your screen and then live and to the right. If everything goes well, I would like to think that we could come online before Sal de Vida. So that's our, our own goal, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Uh, live is doing their own expansion. They got the Phoenix plant. Uh, down to memory lane, what I can tell you is that the lithium revolution started with the Sony Handicams. So 30 years ago, Panasonic made lithium batteries that went into the Sony Handicams, video cameras by the way, and that came from our neighbors, from Phoenix, from Livent. So the history of the salt flat is, no, is not new, to, in lithium is not new to the revolution that we're seeing with cars. This is good brine that can be converted into carbon has been proven for three decades now. Um, needless to say that we have a, a good, great project and we have a large inventory that can give us four phases of development to 60,000 tons. We, ask, we want to crawl before we walk and then we can walk before we run. Importantly, there is a significant upside to Galan. So, don't get stuck with what we are here in phase one. Don't get stuck with um, the short-term things that we need to look at. Just look at Galan for what it can offer in the future, and it's not too far away. Now, the resource update, this is our fourth resource update. I already mentioned, high grade. Uh, we have a significant portion of that into measured. What does it mean? It means that uh, this can com be converted into reserves. We have uh, Ombre Muerto West directly, phase, so three phases of development you'll see on the table, but we have more than enough to secure our reserve stemming going forward. The reserve stemming for phase two was for 40 years. So this is a multi-generational development. And we are there to make a difference in Catamarca with the community as well, and making sure that this works for everyone. Now, the construction update, as I mentioned, the percentages, that, that's all in there. You know, the picture, the big picture you've seen, this is another picture from yesterday as well. You can see how much we're advancing, filling. There's already inventory in point number one. Uh, two weeks ago, it was around 500 tons and counting. The amount of lithium that we put in there, the evaporation that we're experiencing, the level of evaporation and the way that these ponds have been put uh, actually, some of the evaporation rates are better than expected. So hopefully this will continue and it will help for us to start producing lithium chloride concentrate quicker. Now, we do have a, a last year we signed a, an agreement with Glencore that's go through the motions. Everyone asking uh, where is it, where is it? All what I can say is that the timing that Glencore walks is a different space timing to us. We want to get things done quicker, their speed is different. If there is a problem, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, we have to tell, we have to announce it. Things are slower than expected, yes, 
but at the same time, Glencoe is a larger company and do things in their own way. We, um, we are not oblivious to the fact that things are taking time. I just want to give a peace of mind that uh, we are thinking at different scenarios. Uh, that's all what I want to say. And Galan is not going to stop one way or another with what we're doing here in Glencoe. We do have phase two coming up. We are talking about phase two. Not necessarily win Glencoe. We have different parties that are very interested about this. So, look, there is a solution for everything. Hard times, yes. Everyone is looking at when is this going to be done. The funding is probably underpinning the share price, and there is, that's very clear. But I, I want you to keep a big picture about Galan because the funding will get resolved, the execution will continue, we'll come in to be a, a producer in 2025, and we are going to be one of the few independent producers in Argentina. So, um, a little snapshot about our share price, and all what I would like to highlight here is we tally held still. We did an SPP, oversubscribed, we thought that we'll get one and a half million dollars, we got four million dollars. Why do we like the compelling numbers about Ombro Muerto West? This translates in the chart that you see behind you. You see that Ombro Muerto West will be one of the low end cost producers. And the number that you see in there, all in sustaining costs, it is not optimized. We can move the cost into the left, mainly because the assumption on the study was to use diesel power generation. We move that into solar power and we reduce our operating costs significantly. Importantly, we can say that we are one of, the two, one of the few companies that have got low operating costs, or will have low operating costs and low carbon emissions. And that's important from the ESG, traceability, especially in the US and Europe. Four phases of development that I mentioned going from five to 20 to 40 to 60. Um, there, there's a lot of upside coming up here, and uh, this is why Galan can make a difference down the track. About the board, I've uh, got fellow members of the board with me. I'd like to thank them for you know, being so supportive. But uh, this shows that we got a very strong team with Galan. And importantly, Daniel and Claudia, XSQM, and they add a lot of value into Galan and the base in Chile, importantly. The team in Argentina, Juan Carlos Barrera, ex senior VP of operations, and that adds a significant value. And this is reflected in the execution that we're doing. Last. It's not working. Well, and lastly, Green Bushes, come to see me. We have a booth, and um, thanks very much for your, your attention. Thanks. Sorry, Chris. Thanks so much, JP. I knew you go straight to time. We walked up here with the 15 seconds, and you didn't disappoint until the clicker died. Thank you so much. It's a really interesting story. We're going from South America now. We're moving over to Europe. And the largest hard rock lithium resource in Europe. It's located in the Czech Republic, and it is the focus of European Metals Holdings, our next company to take to the stage here at FFC. Cinebec will be, will be, according to this fellow here, and he's a... Uh, He's, he's, he's true. A fully integrated lithium project producing battery grade lithium hydroxide and or lithium carbonate for the rapidly growing European battery industry and electric vehicle industry. So who is this fellow? If you haven't had the good fortune of meeting him yet, uh, I advise you to go out and have a chat with him afterwards. He's a wealth of knowledge. This is Executive Chairman Keith Coglin, and he is going to provide us with an overview of the European metals lithium story. Welcome to you, Keith. Thank you very much, Chrissy, and good morning to you all. Thank you to the organizers for putting this on. It's a fantastic conference. So as Chrissy mentioned, we're developing the Cinevix project, the largest hard rock lithium resource in Europe. It's in the Czech Republic, a historic underground tin mine uh, that actually was mined for tin for somewhere near 600 years, ending in, uh, in the late 70s. So a long history of mining in the region. Um, obviously the usual disclaimer. But as, as you mentioned, it is a fully integrated project. So our end product is not a concentrate. We're going all the way through to battery grade chemical. We have produced both lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate uh, in our test work <coughs> at battery grade standards. Uh, and that'll be sold directly into the EU uh, EV market, which is obviously growing 
very quickly. A couple of headlines of the project here on this slide, as you can see. We've got some very significant partners with us in the project. Our project level partner is a company called Ches. It's the, the Czech National Power Utility. Uh, they own all of the, the grid or the power grid, but in, in Czech Republic, all of the EV charging stations, uh, but they also have significant green energy assets as well, solar power, wind power, et cetera. Very handy partner for us in country. We've got a formal relationship with the European Union via the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, EIT. Uh, the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, is a shareholder of European Metals, and I'll talk about that a little more uh, in a couple of slides' time. And uh, DRA Global are finishing our definitive feasibility study at the moment, which we hope to get out to the market very soon. The, the project does have very good ESG credentials. We are re-entering a historic underground mine which clearly is a lot easier than starting from scratch and trying to break new ground. ESG credentials, very important everywhere in the world, but in particular uh, in Europe, in, in the EU. Uh, I mentioned the EBRD. So the EBRD was established post-war to help uh, Central and Eastern Europe to rebuild. They've had a very strong commitment in the Czech Republic, as you can see there, have committed over 1.4 billion euros to reconstruction in the, in the area. They are a relatively small shareholder of European metals, but um, they stand with us to help develop the project going forward. They are also very well connected with the European Investment Bank, the EIB, and there's plenty of public statements from both of those organisations about their willingness to help enable, help fund the energy transition in Europe. The EU itself <coughs> fully committed to sustainability, fully committed to uh, building a battery industry and fully committed to an EV future. Uh, there's been a lot of money uh, pledged from the EU to, in various ways to help develop the, the new industry. But to be fair, it's been a little slow getting from, from those statements through to projects on the ground for a couple of reasons that I'm, I'm going to discuss. Uh, we see an acceleration in that beginning now. The Critical Raw Materials Act mentioned here was passed uh, it was adopted on the 18th of March, so a month ago. Uh, sorry, uh, I, uh, last, what was that, a week ago, two weeks ago? And it'll come into effect in 20 days' time. So <clears throat> the key tenets of the CRMA, uh, from our point of view, is it effectively it will help speed up the permitting process in Europe, which is slow, and uh, make more funding available to projects like ours. Europe understands that it needs to help enable these projects if it is going to have any sort of um, any sort of self-sufficiency in battery metals going forward, which is you know what they've stated they want to do. The CRMA will uh, release shortly a list of strategic projects. We've clearly made application to be included in that list. Cinevix has already been granted strategic project status under another EU scheme, the Just Transition Fund, which I mentioned here. We've been pre-approved for a grant of approximately 50 million euros via the Just Transition Fund, and we believe that that money will become available from uh, May this, this year onwards. Uh, some more, I won't dwell on this one from a time point of view, but commitments from, from the EU which have recently started to become more concrete, uh, and mainly because of the the EV situation in Europe. So we, we still see good growth with the take up of EUs right across Europe, but a, a slight slowing down uh, in Germany, removed subsidies um, for EVs late last year. Um, but the interesting part is what we're seeing from the Chinese, and, and, and obviously you know, you've heard this if you've been to any of the, the previous discussions over the last couple of days, Chinese EV penetration is nothing short of astonishing, as you'll see from the numbers there on this screen. What's important from the EU point of view is now the number of Chinese-built EVs going into Europe, threatening market share in, in Europe. The, the European car industry is a 650 billion euro a year industry, employing about 13 million people. And clearly, you know, that's a lot of jobs, that's a lot of votes, and the EU is aware of the fact that it needs to keep up with the Chinese, the Chinese domination in this area. It's not even so much about Chinese domination of the lithium market, but Chinese domination of the world car market. 
So this is, in my belief, why the EU has, has woken up. You know, they have been coming last in, in a global sense in regards to putting in place the sort of legislation that they need to. The CRMA really is, is Europe's answer to the IRA. I don't think we'll see the same sort of numbers, but we'll, we'll definitely see the same sort of theme emerging. So obviously Chinese domination of the battery market, everyone knows about that. Interestingly here we're seeing just in the last week, <coughs> uh, you, you see the, the British flag there, just in the last week the announcement for the EVE Energy of a commitment of 1.2 billion <coughs> excuse me, pounds to a battery factory in the UK. From the point of view of the German and the French side of things, we've seen the ACC, the joint venture between Mercedes, Stellantis and Total through SAFT commit 4.4 billion euros to three gigafactories across the region. So we're seeing that side of it kick along and obviously these, these factories need lithium and they'd like to source a reasonable chunk of it from Europe if at all possible. The project there, the, the gold star in the middle of this uh, slide, you can see completely surrounded by these potential off-takers, uh, the, the, the groups I've just mentioned, but obviously all European OEMs. Um, the, the, the solution to building these projects in Europe is a collaborative one. So it will involve all the parties necessary to enable the projects, the EU themselves, the Czech government from our point of view, who are very positive, very supportive of our project, but it also includes those OEMs, EIB, EBRD, et cetera, coming together collaboratively to, to build the projects. You know, a lot of my shareholders say to me, why haven't you signed offtake agreement? Well, I'd like to borrow from Ron Mitchell there, offtake is, is your weapon. You don't give it away lightly and it's part of this whole enabling process. So when when we do go to offtake, it'll be as part of the, the whole solution to building out the project. Uh, the project itself, so you'll see the blue dot at the top of this slide, right on the German border there on the Erzberg Ranges that form a part of that border. Historic underground tin mine, as I mentioned. Uh, slightly smaller blue dot, bottom right of that one is the, the proposed portal entry site. Um, and then further, further south, you see the, the proposed processing plant site. I'll, I'll show this slide to demonstrate the, the mining history of this region, which is very important from the point of view of community acceptance, social license to operate, etc. You know, those, those are historic coal pits in the region, uh, many of which obviously remain unrehabilitated at this point in time. Part of our plan is to use a significant portion of our tailings to help rehabilitate some of these historic um, coal pits, most of which are owned by our project level partner, CHES, and all of these go towards um, assisting us with our ESG credentials in the region. Sinovich is a very large lithium resource. I mentioned at the top, largest hard rock resource in Europe. I showed this slide just to demonstrate what percentage that, you know, Sinovich actually represents. And this is important from the point of view of long-term security of supply, but it's also very important from the point of view of attracting the attention of the EU, of the EIB, et cetera, because of the, you know, the proportion of the potential supply that Sinovix can deliver into what's a very rapidly growing demand scenario in, in the region. Uh, we, we produced um, through a fairly simple or relatively simple process uh, very high grade um, lithium carbonate. Uh, I hope you had to put up a slide on lithium hydroxide that looks like this next week when we've completed that test work and believe we can. Maintaining the ability to produce both of those two battery chemicals is important for us. <coughs> uh, both are required in Europe. The, the, the carbonate scenario is becoming increasingly important, but both chemicals are very much in demand in the region and keeping the optionality on what, what we end up producing as the end product is important to us. For those interested, that this is the, um, the, the flow sheet or simplification of the flow sheet, demonstrating the ability to produce both of those chemicals I just mentioned. Interestingly, we can also <coughs> produce two high grade precursor chemicals, um, lithium sulfate, lithium phosphate, both of which are becoming increasingly important. There's no clear market for each, either of those just yet, but again, goes to our optionality and what we end up producing and, and who we end up selling that to. Uh, historic mining areas, I said, so all the infrastructure is in place. 
You know, it's a, it's a first world location. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> in a historic mining area, so you know, we, we don't have to overcome that local acceptance of mining. ESG credentials are very strong. We had an LCA produced um, when we completed the PFS. That's almost two years old now, so that will be updated with the DFS over the course of the next few months. Um, but you know, as I say, this is very important. When you go to talk to potential off-takers in Europe, it's almost the first thing they want to know is you know, your sustainability, your green credentials. <clears throat> and it, you know, it's, not just, it's not just talk. The, the, the um, consumers, the, our customers are very focused on this. The LCA I mentioned just on, um, on uh, <clears throat> CO2 footprint, with you see the two bars there of Sinovitz the second is with the, the use of green energy for the project. Chairs, as I mentioned, uh, is the power utility in the Czech Republic. They have committed to delivering green energy to the project, so it gives us a very low GWP. Uh, the project is also rated very favourably with regards to water usage and acidification. So again, very high ESG credentials. The, the board management team that we've put together, uh, we've managed to uh, recruit a couple of key industry people out of other projects around the world, and this, this, it's very, very handy doing that because obviously you know, there, there isn't an enormous amount of lithium experience in the world. It's still a relatively new industry. But this is, this is the EMH team, and that's strongly augmented by our project. Um, level partner chairs who employ something like 35,000 people in the Czech Republic, many of whom we get to tap into um, at very low cost to us. So going forward, the bottom half of this slide I think is the important part to focus on. So those strategic partner discussions are well underway. They, as I say, it, it will be a collaborative approach involving all the necessary people to enable a project like this, <coughs> which will lead into the the final um, permitting, it, it, it is slow, but that will speed up with the advent of the CRMA, slow by global standards. Uh, the completion of the DFS, the pilot program, so we've completed a pilot, pro program, <laughs> pilot program for lithium carbonate. We have those samples um, ready to pass on to potential uh, offtake partners, and the hydroxide part of it will be completed very shortly. And at, at the bottom there, very importantly, Cinevex being such a large resource, our phase one production is a shade under 30,000 tonnes per annum of battery grade hydroxide or the carbonate equivalent. That's a relatively small production profile for such a, a large resource. So we will be embarking on a, a, a study to look at significantly increasing that production um, as we get towards the end of the DFS. I've timed it almost perfectly, Chrissy. Thank you all very much for your attention. As Chris said, got a booth out there just behind the, um, the EV. Please come and have a chat to me if you'd like to know anything more about the project. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Kate. Great presentation, considering the time to which you were out last night. <laughs> yes. No story. I believe there was a gang of lithium presenters out last night, and they may have tried to lead our next presenter astray as well, but he stayed firm because he knew he had big things to share with you today. So he's the only one, I think, with a real spring in his step today. So I actually asked him to describe himself to me so that I could describe him to all of you today. And he said, oh, Chrissy, I'm gonna be one that's not gonna overstay my welcome on the stage. So we really wanna eke out our residual value from you though. So I, will you notice that I've managed to find you an extra five minutes today? Okay. So at least look happy about that, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you please put your hands together for the great Joe Lowry. Let's talk lithium. Given the massive largesse I have just received from who I called yesterday the angel of death um, when she came to kick us off the stage after the panel, um, I'm gonna start off with a bit of trivia and I don't wanna throw my friend JP under the bus but I kind of will because he did talk about the Sony battery in the 90s. That did not come from Ombre Muerto. Later it did. The original raw material, because I sold it to Sony back in the day, that's how long I've been around, came from a hard rock mine in North Carolina. 
And when that mine shut down, we transitioned to Ombre Muerto. So he didn't tell you anything that was not true. I just wanted to give you that little additional bit of clarification. The original material that went into the lithium ion battery was hard rock mined in North Carolina, processed in North Carolina. And the reason I go through this is I kind of want to take you guys full circle because America's trying to be a lithium producer again, but we were the original guys. So with that, I will get on with it. Last year I stood up here in kind of a very different scenario. Um, I called it the lithium decade and I still believe it is the lithium decade. Absolutely believe that. But in any industry that's gonna grow 10X in 10 years, and that's about what the numbers will bear out in, in 2020, lithium new is about 300,000 tons. And in 2030, by most accounts, it'll be at least 3 million. Anytime you have an industry that grows that fast, you have growing pains and you have volatility. And that's kind of where we are. I loved what the first presenter from Argonaut said about price. I completely agree with him and we'll get into that. But um, I'm not here to tell you how to think, but I am here to give you some questions you should be considering. And that is where I will start if I can get this thing to work. So we've been through a ride in lithium price. It's been pretty dramatic. We've heard it referenced before yesterday and today with the first speaker, lithium prices went up to 80,000. But why did we have that price bubble and why do we have the drop in price today? And I would say to you that if we look at the panic buying that went on in 2022 and you have excess capacity all over the lithium ion battery supply chain in China and that is going to continue to be a problem that's going to continue to set up volatility. And if you spend any time in China, and I know a lot of people in this room have, and I, I have, I lived there for a while, um, what happens, um, they just keep building capacity. And when you do that, and they started to drive the lithium price up, I never thought the lithium price would get to 40000 That's how smart I am. And I sure never thought it would get to 80. When it got to 80 and kind of peaked out Q4 of 2022, um, the lithium ion battery supply chain was stuffed from cathode to cells to packs. And what happens in China when they see the price start to ease and come down? They stop buying and they start living off the inventory because they think next week, it's going to be cheaper, so why, why should I buy this week? And then we saw the run down. Price and um, The narrative became high prices, fixed high prices, those high prices attracted lipidolite and low grade ore. Was it Mandy Leyland on my podcast? And he's the only one that agrees with me that it was really more in for sure, but I think it's going to happen this year if it hasn't already happened. And I think Ron talked about it yesterday, and it's been alluded to today. Albemarle fouled on Pilbara's BMX auction with their auction, and the price is okay. Wasn't great, but it was okay. And it does seem like prices have bottomed. But that's a question that you need to ask yourself, especially if you're going to put money in the market. And 
Keith already talked about it, the Argonaut guy talked about it, I'll talk about it a little bit, but is the EV growth story still intact? You need to ask yourself that question because the narrative and coming from the United States in an election year, EVs have become a left versus right kind of thing and it's very political right now in the United States and there's a lot of stories about, oh, people don't want EVs, they're gonna buy hybrids if they buy anything. The EV growth story is still intact. I'll show you the numbers. Keith showed some numbers. Um, I don't want to beat it to death, but EVs are going to do just fine. But you have to you have to be comfortable with that because the lithium industry is now completely tied to batteries. And I'll show you the I'll show you a pie chart in a minute. But when I started, there was not a commercial lithium ion battery. And now it's really all that matters when you're looking at lithium demand. And then what's the cost curve look like going forward? It's going up. We'll get into that a little bit. And finally, we had the DLE guy on the panel yesterday. And that's a question that continues to be out there is, when will DLE make an impact? I think it will. I don't know when. But you need to be looking at that because that really has the capacity now that you're, you're getting companies like Exxon involved with huge balance sheets that can do whatever they want to do that aren't troubled about raising the money to do DLE. If that goes, if I'm a small hard rock guy, I'm gonna start getting very nervous. What are my assumptions? Well, Henry Sanderson showed a nice slide yesterday about China's dominance of the lithium ion battery supply chain. I completely agree with what he's saying. China is dominant. But there, there, are, too many, there are too many suppliers in China right now. We, we have too much capacity. And that's going to continue to drive volatility. And you're going to have, and the first gentleman who spoke talked about it's going to be tough to supply this market, even if you have limited periods where it looks like oversupply. And I, and I think he's right. But the battery destocking and restocking is also going to add to volatility, and you need to be watching that. And I think BYD and CATL together, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I will say that I think they've done a great job of taking control of the lithium narrative as well. And I think that's the kind of thing. I think you need to be really skeptical about just about everything you hear coming out of China about what's happening. I think many of the analysts have been co-opted and tend to sing out of the battery maker's songbook when they, they talk about the industry. And I think that's a, it's a real concern. Um, capital intensity keeps going up, that's gonna drive the cost curve. There's some Canaccord numbers that say that the average capital intensity has gone up 50% since 2019. I think that's, that's close, but if you look at, and I'll talk a couple times about Thacker Pass today, uh, which just got the big loan, and I think Scott talked about it yesterday, a couple other people referenced the $2.26 billion DOE loan that they're getting for Thacker Pass. Well, if you do the math on spending the whole project's three billion. The DOE can't loan for the mining part of that. Uh, that's a pretty high capital intensity number. It's, it's pushing sixty thousand a ton. So that's going to continue to drive the cost curve up. You're going to see that happening, and you're going to probably see it on just about every ex China project that goes on. The capital intensity keeps going up, which is going to drive the cost curve up. And um, Lupidolite, I, I think my friends from Arcane, they have a nice slide about lipidolite. I want to give them credit for that. I didn't use it in my presentation, but the lower grade lipidolites are probably at $25,000 a ton or more. So you, you can't have a consistent growth. You can't have 400,000 tons of lipidolite in the market if the lithium price stays at $15,000 a ton, it just it doesn't work. You, you, we're gonna need an incentive price. And then the narrative on lithium has gotten so negative. I've been in the business, as I think I said before, 34 years, I've never seen sentiment this negative. And 
it doesn't make sense to me. Because even at $15,000 a ton, historically, that's a pretty high lithium price. But the narrative now is all, well, it was 80,000. And that is one of the key takeaways I want you to have here, whether you agree with me or not, I want you to think about it is, there isn't a lithium price. The China spot price is not the lithium price. There are a range of lithium prices. Korea is the second biggest market for lithium chemicals in the world. Japan's third now. But in both of those countries last year, the average price for in Korea, lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide averaged about $50, $50 a kilo. Carbonate in Japan last year averaged $56 a kilo. And you can say, well, I don't like you to talk about averages. You know, where, where did the end, end the year? You ended the year in Japan at $40 a kilo. November was 35. October was 35. So this, the price fell 80%. On the China spot price, that's true. But when you start looking at the lithium industry, think a little bit deeper than what Reuters tells you the lithium price is, or Bloomberg NEF tells you the lithium price is. It, it's a range out there. And um, when you talk about lithium price bottoming, there's going to be multiple bottoms because there's multiple prices. And you should think about that too. So what are my expectations? And I'm going to repeat myself. I'm going to, talk, I'm going to say EV probably 20 times in this presentation. But I believe price bottoms this year. I'm not smart enough to know when that is. And I believe it will start to rise. I already told you about the Japanese prices and how different they are than China spot. Um, one thing we have seen this time around that we haven't seen in the past is that the major lithium suppliers have, whether, whether their discipline holds or not, I don't know, but they have either taken capacity off or delayed projects to try to make sure um, the market goes the way they want to. And we've had Albemarle, SQM, Arcadium have all made moves to try to make sure that things stay in balance. And I, you know, I, think that, I think that's a good thing. We've never had discipline in the lithium industry. It was always about sell as much volume as you can. So to have SQM behaving in a disciplined manner is, is a fresh thought. EV growth is going to continue. That's my core assumption. And if that doesn't happen, then I won't be here next year for sure. Um, row motion, we, there's a lot of different numbers, EV numbers. I use row motion. I think Anthony C used somebody else's numbers yesterday. His number for last year was a little, it was over 14, mine's 13.8. It doesn't really matter. It was low 30% growth last year. Um, Road Motion says 2024 will be 18. I'll have the, some forensics on that number in a minute. But then the other thing you need to, the great thing about the fall in price, is you're not hearing a lot about sodium ion right now in, in energy storage systems, because if lithium stays below 25,000 a ton, sodium ion is pretty much a dog that doesn't hunt, and it will have a very small niche. At 80,000 a ton, ESS wasn't going to grow. ESS is booming right now with lithium technology. And Roe Motion's projection for this year is 200, 200, roughly 200 gigawatt hours. You put a lithium intensity number of 0.8 on that, and basically it takes you four world-class projects, four Kacharis, which is in startup right now, to just do the demand for energy storage. So EVs are important but energy storage is going to be increasingly uh, important going forward. Um, geopolitics. I come from a country with more than 340 million people, and we're down to Biden and Trump again. Sorry. Now, I'm, I'm not going to get into that, because there's a breakfast tomorrow where I believe a gentleman's going to talk about the US election. but. A lot of things aren't going to get settled with where EVs go in the United States until we have that election over and we can stop saying, well, Trump will kill the IRA. Trump's not going to kill the IRA. It's not in his best interest because most of the investments that will go into batteries in the US are in Trump states. 
Trump's going to start more oil drilling, and the environmentalists aren't going to like that. But to, to paint the EV lens, I heard Donald Trump say last week on CNBC that I'm not going to let BYD build in Mexico and bring those into the country. I'm fine having BYD build a plant here because I want the jobs. That shocked people. And I promise you, Joe Biden's not going to ask BYD to build, build a plant in the United States, because that, that's not how that works. I'm not going to get into other countries' elections, because I, I know precious little about them. But there's, there's a lot of geopolitics that are, are getting settled that are going to impact what happens in the energy transition. I just unhappily have, I'm from the country that uh, has Biden running against Trump yet again. Okay, what's the market look like? There are different, different people have different numbers for what happened last year. I have demanded about 925. Some people have a million tons of LCE. They're all pretty close. The important part about this pie chart, and I said something similar last year, if any of you were here last year. This used to be a beautiful, colorful chart. It is increasingly blue and blue represents battery. Lithium has just become a, a battery dependent business. And by 2030, more than 95% of that little pie chart will be blue. And that, all you have to know to project where the lithium industry is going now is where our battery is going and how many gigawatt hours or terawatt hours are going to be made. I'll repeat myself this. This is industry's all about batteries. This is a supply chain insights slide. It basically shows you the different components of battery, EVs, ESS, and then portables. EVs dominate, but ESS is increasingly important. If we want to parse that down to uh, each category, you can see the numbers yourself. This year will be 1.2 terawatt hours, which if you put a lithium intensity on it, it yields about 1.1 million tons of lithium demand for battery. And that is significant growth. And I, I don't think you need to worry about where the industry is going from a demand standpoint. Most of the arguments that any of us have are about supply, not about demand. The EV, 18 million units, over 10 of them are China. That's the level of dominance, and I don't think that ends anytime soon. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it just is what it is. Um, Europe, 3.8. The US, or it's actually North America, US, and Canada, a little over two. Maybe that doesn't grow as fast as people expected, but. That's one of the things Americans hate. We're, we're just not that important right now in the global EV story. Uh, there's still a lot of range anxiety. Our players in the EV market have failed miserably. Uh, you don't see a lot of GM EVs or Ford EVs on the road. And um, that really kind of controls the narrative in the United States. And I, for one, would love to see BYD's cars sell in the US because they have, if you really want ubiquitous EV adoption in America, if you let BYD in, then guys that can't afford Teslas could afford an EV because they have EVs at every price point. And we just don't have that. Elon likes to say in, in, in the, the negativity, negativity of the narrative, a lot of it is anytime Elon talks, that's what the story is, and Elon says he's in between two growth waves because, you know, whatever they call their $25,000 model, whether it's the Model 2 or something else, um, until they have it, we really don't have, there's just not a nice car you can buy until they let the Chinese cars in that are at a price point where we're going to get huge adoption growth in America. And I don't want to make this America centric, but it is the second largest car market in the world after China. There has been a lot of negative press about, you know, people will talk about every perturbation in the growth of EVs in China. 
this is current as of the end of February. Yeah, it's a sawtooth chart, but directionally, it's going, it's going in the right direction. So I think people can just stop worrying about NEV demand and its new energy vehicle in China, and that includes plug-in hybrids as well. But despite the seasonality, and the China market is very seasonal, and people, people will read that, oh, the last two months sales were down, so the sky must be falling, but that's not the way China works, and that, that's a good indicator, the way that's a sawtooth, but the direction is up. Supply forecasts. That's where I say most of the disagreement in the industry about where we're going between now and 2030, it's not about demand, it's about supply, and if it's oversupply, then it's a different price story than if it's a tight market. Um, I'll refer to a, a podcast episode again. Um, I talked to Andy Leila and I said, why are the supply forecasts so bad? And he says, well, if you work at a big iBank, the job you don't want is going through all the PFS and DFS to create a supply forecast. So the new guy gets the, the worst job. And generally speaking, he does a bad job at the new job. And if you look at, and I'm not gonna, I usually will pick on Goldman or Morgan, but I'm not gonna do that today. You can take, take anybody and look at their forecast between now and 2030, and you will see projects on there and volumes in there where the project's not financed, and right now financing is going to get tougher and tougher until people have clarity on price, especially ex-China. And the Chinese analysts always put any Chinese project as being on time and ramping quickly. And trust me, it doesn't matter who it is. Lithium projects are always late, except for maybe JPs. I don't want to throw them under the bus again. And um, they ramp rather slowly. And if you're from WA and you think, talk about lithium chemicals, you've got Queen Anna and Kemerton as evidence of that. Um, I was talking to somebody this morning. I said, go, go out on YouTube and look at the original Queen Anna video from, I think they were supposed to be ramped in 2019. And they haven't taken that video down. And I don't understand why that is, but they haven't done it. Um, Increasing capital costs and lower price expectations, as I'll just repeat myself, that's really, it's gonna affect financing, it already has. Everybody in America is just thrilled that Thacker Pass got that loan. Let me put that in perspective to you. Last year I showed you a map of gigafactories. Keith showed one for Europe. There's a map of the North America, there's 25 or 30 gigafactories out there. Thacker Pass, will take three years to build, another year to ramp, and it does one. A 50 gigawatt hour gigafactory will use 100% of phase one of Thacker Pass. So if America's gonna build a robust, or North America's gonna have a robust battery supply chain, there's gonna have to be a lot more investment than, than we are seeing now. Because you can't find another financed lithium project in the US right now. And even Albemarle reopening Kings Mountain, you know, a brownfield, they've backed off on the timing of that. So how, do, how, does this, how does this happen? And if you can't build lithium projects, you can't have a China-free supply chain. That's pretty simple logic. Um, Chile. Chile has a lot of potential beyond the Atacama, a lot of Solars, very much similar. There's a lot of potential in Argentina, there's, but there's a lot of active projects in Argentina. But when Chile elected a communist leader and they changed their lithium policy, if you're going to develop, there's, the Atacama was left alone except for SQM was basically forced because of the expiration of their agreement to do the deal with Codelco. And there's a couple other projects that are grandfathered, but anything else that's gonna get developed in Chile is gonna to have to have somebody that's willing to give the government a 50 
percent plus one share majority ownership in a carried interest. And from my perspective, there's only one country that will be willing to do that, and it's China. Chinese money will flow in. And I don't know if Boric will not get reelected and that, that those laws will change, but there's a lot of potential. In, uh, in, in, and everybody loved the Chile story because they have a free trade agreement with the U.S., so they'll, they'll be IRA compliant. But if no Western company is going to be willing to put the capital in the ground, it's going to be a problem. So the other thing that's required for new projects in Chile is DLE. And right now, there is no commercial DLE, pure DLE, out there. And until there is, you're, you're taking one of your best lithium provinces and kind of putting it on ice. When, whether it's Henry or any of the other people that have talked about China's processing lead, that story tends to be skewed to hard rock. Because WA hard rock goes to China, almost all of it, until the, the project that Queen Anne and Kemerton are actually at scale. But what doesn't get told in the narrative is that the brine projects pretty much make the lithium chemicals at the brine project or nearby. So when you bring brine into the argument, China's processing lead is much lower than what people think. It's still major. It's 64 percent, but it isn't the 90 to 95 percent that people talk about when they only consider hard rock. So China's processing lead is going to continue to decline as brine grows. And I think that's an important point when you're trying to get a balanced view of what's happening in the lithium industry. The Western Hemisphere was very slow to uh, put capital on the ground and still isn't, still isn't at the speed it needs to be. But I like to try to paint a balanced picture that Chile is, nobody ever talks about Chile as being a processor. Because it, it's not the way they think about it. But if you're making battery quality at the site, then you're not dependent on China. This is my supply and demand number. I, I'm, people think I'm a wild lithium bull. I, th I think it's a pretty much a balanced market until the end of the decade, where I think it's going to be hard to get to 3 million tons of supply. But the other point that's important here is that when you start operating at 90% capacity, you're going to have shortages. And what the analysts usually say is it's supply, demand, and if it's one LCE over, it's oversupply. That's not really the way it works. And because the supply chain is so low, Anthony C. yesterday during the panel talked about the lithium in his Tesla in Hong Kong. And when back in the day when he got that first Model S, I think it was mined somewhere or it came out of Ombre Muerto. It went to Bessemer City, North Carolina. It went to Skoko Island, Japan. It went from Skoko Island, Japan back to a Panasonic factory. It became a cell. It went to Fremont. It became a Tesla. And then it got shipped to Hong Kong. Lithium's got to travel a long way. The supply chain is really long. And not, not much is happening to change that. So you're going to have tight markets, even when supply looks on a spreadsheet like it's in balance. These are Goldman's numbers. The only reason I point this out is because Goldman Sachs has very low pricing in, like they say, 2025. It, they've lowered the price to 10 bucks, And that's essentially on the back of what they think is going to happen in Lopidolite. But their supply and dem their demand numbers higher than mine, and their supply numbers a little higher than mine. But even Goldman has 2030 in a deficit. So most of the people looking at this industry going forward are not that far off. The only thing I really have a disagreement with, and that's why I rely on my buddies from Arcane on their lipidolite costs, but you can't have $10 lithium if your growth is in China's lipidolite that costs $25 a kilo to produce. And yes, there's some pitolite that's lower than that, but it's a spectrum of cost. And that's something you need to keep in your, keep in your mind. Canaccord, I'm much more on Team Canaccord. They, they have a, their undersupply is actually bigger than mine. 
And uh, there's going to be market tightness, and that's going to put price back up. The real question is, how high will price go? And I believe what the last cycle, the last 18 months has showed us is that there is swing supply. The lapidolite and the grinding up ceramic material and bringing in DSO uh, from Africa, if you, get, if you have another run up above 40,000, all that's gonna come back into the market and it's gonna come back in quickly. So I think we have found that there's a natural cap on a price run up. I'm not saying price will never go to 80,000 again, but if it goes there, it's not gonna be there for very long. And that's spot price because well, let me, sh let me show you an SQM slide in a minute, and I'll explain what I mean. This is Albemarle's numbers. Albemarle's actually downgraded their 2030 forecast. Last year when I was here, it was 3.3. It went up to 3.7. Now it's back down to 3.3. But in all cases, it's 10% higher than my best number, and it's about the same as Goldman's. The cost curve. Price is going to be determined by the cost curve, and this is Canaccord's 2024 cost curve. All we've had happen in the last few years is the cost curves got steeper. And it's not just Canaccord. Morningstar, Seth Goldstein's the, their lead analyst. This is their 2030 cost curve. He only has 2.5 million tons of demand because he says that he thinks it's supply limited, so it's not real demand. You can debate that number, but you go up to 20,000 in his numbers for, for lipidolite, which would keep price where into the 20s, a lot of these projects get wiped out because this is just the DFS cost numbers. And if you're at 15,000, a lot of that doesn't get built. It sure is not going to get financed. And the other thing I would say is price at C1 cash, and I don't want to get into a lot of jargon here, but C1 cash cost is basically real cash cost. C2 is you, you add depreciation, amortization. C3 is you add corporate costs. And you have to have, it's C3 costs that really drive what people will invest, not, not the cash costs. Because when a market's growing as fast as lithium is, you got to put capital in the ground, and you don't put capital in the ground when you're, your expectation is to get your marginal cost back. Lapidolite, this is another number from Andy Leyland's Supply Chain Insights. Uh, just shows, in his mind, lapidolite is going to be much more limited than Goldman thinks in terms of volume, but it's also C1 cost at 14.1. You don't build a lot of projects with lapidolite. Price. I've got five minutes left, and then she's going to stand up, and she's going to do this, and she's going to do this, and she's going to start walking towards me. So I am prepared. Um, simple benchmark slide. Everybody knows this story. 80,000 to... 13, I think, at the low point. But this is what I look at. The most transparent reporter of lithium prices is SQM's quarterlies. And this is the story I want to leave you with on price, is that in Q4 of 2020, SQM's LCE yield, and you can go online and look up the numbers yourself if you want, because they're all out there, all their quarterlies was 530. It rose in two years later in Q4 of 2022, it went to 59. It didn't go to 80. In Q4 of 23, it was down to 16. I don't know what their Q1 number is going to be. I have a suspicion that it's going to be at least 16 because I've looked at the Japan or the China import statistics from Chile for January and February, and they're still around 16. And that's, that's their low price. So what they're selling to Korea and Japan is at higher price. So that may turn up. So maybe we have bottom, but I'm not calling it yet. But my point is, the, if this is the low on the right-hand side at 16, it's three times higher than the last low. The cost curve's higher. You're not, you're not going to have five, a 530 quarterly report from SQM, again, in my life. Morningstar, I guess I like Seth because we agree. 
he shows 2024 pricing by Q4 going into the low 20s. This is an old Abomaro slide. And there's a caveat on it. This was done when their forecast was still 3.7, but th they made the case last year that pricing had to go to 20 in order for enough projects to get built. And even with 20 hour, they only showed 2.9 million tons in 2030. So they, they said there would be a 800,000 ton shortfall. Now that shortfall by their new demand estimates, 400,000, but you get the picture. That's more than demand was in 2020. So, I mean, all things kind of lead to higher prices. How high they go, I can't tell you. My thought is this year, price gets into the low 20s, probably in Q4. I don't know. I, that's my guess. But what do other people think? Canaccord. They're 20, the last report I have from Canaccord, which is pretty recent, 16 bucks in 2024, long-term 22. Goldman, 11. I mean, I don't think it's possible for them to be right this year because price isn't going anywhere near 11. And to average it down, price would have to go to like eight. Um, and I, I don't think that's gonna happen. Next year, they said the price is even lower. And then their long term is reasonable at 18. Macquarie, they're all over the block. I mean, they, they, the next one, their numbers change more dramatically than anybody's in my mind. But this is where their last report was, and that's quite recent, UBS. But there's pretty much consensus that lithium prices have to be higher than they are today to, to meet the supply expectations. I'm going to finish early. 158. Okay, closing comments. What do I want you to take away? Because I, I really, everybody needs to work this out for themselves, what they think, how they think about this, assuming you care. Banks are gonna continue to try to force feed the commodity narrative. I said it last year here, I'll say it this year here. I know it's future facing commodities conference, but lithium's not a commodity. It's especially chemical. The only people that can make it a commodity is the battery guys and they'd have to agree on specs. You can't warehouse lithium hydroxide and take delivery because specifications and approval, especially for electric vehicles, are an arduous process and you just can't have a random warehouse full of lithium hydroxide that meets a certain spec because it has to be individually qualified. Excess capacity it's going to keep driving volatility. This is not going to be a smooth road. I, I think you could see forty or fifty thousand dollar lithium again between now and twenty thirty. I hope that doesn't happen. I'd rather see stable a stable environment. But when the Chinese go back to buying and restocking, it, it could get ugly. And, and I I do think that once you get to fifty then the swing supply will come in pretty quickly. I don't think it needs to go to 80 for that to happen. But it did not happen in 2017 and 2018 when the price got to the high 20s or around 30. That was the high point of the last cycle. And you didn't hear people talking about lapidolite then. So it had to go higher for that to even be brought in. There is no shortage of lithium. You don't even, all the lithium that's needed for the energy transition has already been found hasn't necessarily already been drilled out. But, you know, people will say, well, there's not, not going to be enough lithium for the world. Don't worry about it. There's plenty of lithium. And later on, they'll be recycling. Are you, are you going to give me like two minutes from the time that we started early? OK, thank you. She's so nice. Um, there isn't a single lithium price. I'll leave with, I've said it. I, I like to repeat that because people don't seem to learn that quickly. The China spot price is not the lithium price, it's a lithium price. And if you're going to invest in lithium, I will hearken again to the words of Anthony C. He didn't say it here yesterday, but I've heard him say it many times. If you're gonna invest in lithium, do the work. It's not that hard. If you really wanna dig into what's going on, you can do it, you don't need me. You can do it yourself, DIY. 
And then you can also listen to the Global Lithium podcast and hear a lot of people that know a lot about this. I've got several people in this audience that have been guests. And with that, Chrissy, I leave it to you. Are you Thanks. sure? <laughs> Thank you very much. I was actually going to take my last 32 seconds and shake your hand. Yeah, I would think so. That's right. I didn't even wear a watch today. I just wore diamonds just so I didn't have to keep my eye on the time. Let's it was do hugs. absolutely <laughs> bloody brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Put your hands together again, team. And he will be here today. We just need to keep you away from those lithium people who lead you astray. That is really good. Uh, and if you'd like to recommend that talk to people, I actually started taking pictures of the slides and I realised that that's one thing that Joe um, doesn't really like us to do because that is his personal intel that he's sharing with us here exclusively. So but you can, of course, tell people to have a look at our YouTube channel and they'll be able to keep up with what it is that he was saying and imparting to us. So we've heard a lot about the fact that lithium is paving the way to a decarbonised future. I think the question that we all ask is, as we are, we are um, claiming this lithium, how do we work to address how we decarbonise the production of lithium? So our next company is a leader in this field, a thought leader in this field, Vulcan. And Vulcan's purpose is to empower a net zero carbon future to supply lithium chemicals and renewable energy from Europe for Europe via its zero carbon lithium project. The company's founder is Dr. Francis Whedon, a battery minerals, materials and renewable energy industry executive, and he's going to discuss the recent progress. Oh, wait, I've been told to go backwards. Excuse me one second. Oh, you're quite right, Gerno. Excuse me, and you did get to stand up and I ignored you completely. So our next talk, excuse me, is with Dr. Francis Whedon and Vulcan. So we're talking lithium universe, how I could miss lithium universe because it's so big, it sort of does block out a lot of things. So this is the dream team we're talking about now, led by pioneer, uh, lithium pioneer Yi Tan and the dream team, LU7. They've got a really bold vision of building a lithium resource and refinery facility in Canada that will provide the critical materials for batteries helping the world to transition towards a cleaner and greener future. So this is the company's executive director, Gerno Abel, and he's going to provide some further insights into this. And Gerno, my apologies for skipping all right. yourselves. <laughs> okay. Could you please make him very welcome, everyone? After a 10-year hiatus, a new lithium company emerges from the galaxy. Introducing Lithium Universe Limited, committed to building a lithium future. Our company is chaired by the original lithium trailblazer, Mr. Iggy Tan. Iggy ran Greenbush's Lithium in 1995 and was the first to commission a lithium carbonate plant in Australia. Iggy was also one of the first mining executives with an eye on the lithium ion battery future some 25 years ago. Iggy and his team built Mount Catlin rated at 137,000 tonnes per annum, and they also built the Jiangsu Lithium Carbonate Plant, rated at 17,000 tonnes per annum. When Iggy first joined Galaxy, their market cap was less than $10 million before he put them on a path to ultimately reach in excess of $2.5 billion on merger with Orocobre. Galaxy is still regarded as the first large-scale integrated mine to refinery project of its kind. Importantly, when these projects were designed, built and commissioned, the lithium prices were but a fraction of where they are today. It's a testament to Iggy's ability to deliver difficult projects on time and on budget in extremely difficult markets. Joining Iggy on the board is Greenbush's veteran, Mr. Pat Scallon. Pat ran Greenbush's for over 25 years and saw an, over, an oversaw production increase from 200,000 tonnes to in excess of 1.4 million tonnes per annum. We've also got international lithium downstream technology expert, Dr. Jin Wan Lu. Dr. Lu is former Galaxy and designed and commissioned Jiangsu. Introducing our Apollo exploration project. Apollo is located along the Trans Tiger Highway in James
Adina. It's been a hotbed of activity over the previous 18 months for those companies. Phenomenal drill results, now equally as impressive mineral resource estimates. Patriot coming in at 109 million tonnes at 1.4% lithium, and Winsome 59 million tonnes at 1.1% lithium. We're all probably old enough to recognise and remember the NBA Dream Team. The likes of Jordan, Stockton, Malone, Pippen, teaming up to take on the rest of the world to prove their might. Well, not one to be outdone, some 30 years later, Iggy has put together his own lithium dream team. Joining Iggy, Pat and Jin Wan, we've got the former GM of operations at Galaxy, Mr. Terry Stark. Roger Pover, who ran Mount Catlin. Hoi Nguyen, who built Mount Catlin. And John Loxton, he built Jiangsu with Iggy. He's also on the team. Our most recent appointment is the former CFO of Galaxy, John Zabolski. Stepping through what a typical lithium mine development timeline might look like, from maiden through scoping, PFS, DFS, funding and construction, can ultimately take in excess of 10 years. Let's have a look at what the Dream Team achieved at Mount Catlin, from first maiden to first product, in an extraordinary three-year time period. How did they achieve this? They skipped scoping in PFS, ran a number of other processes in parallel, Alst, whilst leveraging an incredible team culture. Looking at what's happening further down south at Quinana, after commencing construction in 2016, it's evident that this plant is still only operating at 8 to 10% of design. Capital cost blowouts have been experienced to the tune of over $300 million. The story at Abermile's Camelton plant, not much different. Construction delays, commissioning delays, and still only operating at less than 50% of design. Most recently, they had to parachute in Chinese operating expertise to help fill that gap. If we turn the page to Canada, the story stays the same. We've got Namaska Lithium who completed their DFS in 2011. After spending in excess of $250 million to deliver only 110,000 tonnes to market, they filed for Chapter 11 in 2015. Namaska Lithium completed their DFS in 2018, and after spending in excess of $400 million, failed to make startup in 2019. Let's compare this to the Dream Team's track record at Jiangsu. From breaking ground to project completion and commissioning, an extraordinary 25-month period. Capital cost, more than reasonable $120 million. The plant operated at design and delivered the highest quality lithium carbonate to market. It's evident that Canada is forcing a critical mineral strategy. Mostly evidenced by Sinomine's forced divesture from Power Metals Corp and relinquishment of their spodumene offtake agreement. Canada also has a burgeoning automotive industry. In excess of 1.6 million vehicles are exported annually. It's clear that Canada appears to be forcing a downstream solution. There is also a real lithium conversion gap that currently exists in North America. Approximately 900 gigawatts of battery and cathode factories have been announced to come online circa 2028. This will require 800,000 tonnes per annum of lithium chemicals to meet this demand. The current planned conversion capacity is only 100,000 tonnes per annum. Currently, there are actually no operating refineries in Canada and the USA. So North America as a whole has no operating refineries. In fact, 95% of all conversion comes from China, a country that North America is trying to desperately decouple itself from. So where does that leave us? We've got the government pushing a downstream requirement. There are no operating converters in North America and there's limited processing expertise amongst junior exploration companies. Our solution is the Quebec Lithium Processing Hub. The Quebec Lithium Processing Hub is a mine to battery grade lithium carbonate strategy where we're going to leverage a million tonne per annum multi-purpose concentrator to feed a 16,000 tonne per annum lithium carbonate plant. 
The ore for the concentrator, which will be based on the proven Mount Catlin design, will be sourced from two spots, either our own at Apollo or by entering into five-year joint venture agreements with other juniors in the area. This will afford them the opportunity to bring forward their cash flows and accelerate their own mine development. If after five years they choose to want to have a concentrator on their own site, we'll be able to do this for them and they'll be able to become a concentrate producer in their own right. Primero has been engaged to complete the engineering study for us. They're looking at determining what the capital cost will be to replicate the proven Mount Catlin design, but for the Canadian environment. Our 16,000 tonne per annum battery grade lithium carbonate plant will be based on the proven Jiangsu design. Battery grade carbonate will be sold into North American markets and potentially Europe. This will meet the Canadian government's critical mineral strategy, but more importantly, provide a real downstream solution for Canadian lithium miners. Hatched Engineering is completing the refinery study for us. They built Jiangsu with the Dream Team and are determining how much it's going to cost to replicate that design, but for the Canadian environment. We've also recently signed an option on land in Canada for our refinery location. We've chosen the Beckencore Industrial Park. It's got access to, with sealed roads, rail, and proximity to a deep water port. Made the location almost perfect. Our design incorporates that first initial train for 16,000 tonne per annum, lithium carbonate, but we've also made sure we've got additional optionality for two additional trains to bring the cumulative total production capacity up to 48,000 tonnes per annum to make a real dent into that 800,000 per annum conversion gap we identified earlier. We're also completing our lithium carbonate refinery test program under the guidance of Dr. Jin Wan Lu. So we're conducting MET testing on a number of internationally sourced spodumene samples to ensure that we're building the most robust refinery possible. We'll be able to import ore from anywhere in the world to Beckencore for processing. This will allow the Canadian market to keep maturing. So, in summary, we're looking to fill the real downstream gap, conversion gap, that exists in North America. Three. We've got the Lithium Dream Team, a proven board and management who execute difficult projects on time, and on budget, and we've also got the Quebec Lithium Processing Hub strategy. So there's no better time than now to join us on our mission to build a lithium future. Thank you. Well done, thank you very much, Gano. Right, I was uh, discussing before about my theories on lithium and producing lithium in a decarbonised way and mentioned that uh, zero carbon lithium project in uh, Europe and Vulcan. So without going into that in any more further detail, because I think you did a rather good job explaining all that away last time, uh, would you please welcome Dr. Francis Whedon. He's a battery materials and renewable energy industry executive and he is going to discuss the recent progress at its zero carbon lithium and there's some interesting things that may be just around the corner that could really set things off for them so please make him welcome everyone thanks very much um hi everyone as i mentioned my name is francis fedeen i'm the founder and uh, formerly ceo now the executive chair of vulcan energy resources um the world's first zero carbon lithium company um i'd like to start off with this image i think it really encapsulates what we're doing quite nicely. This is the upstream part of our project. What you're looking at here is the Upper Rhine Valley in southwest Germany bordering France. And um, this is our mine just here. Uh, this is a geothermal renewable energy plant. It is um, currently producing, it's a commercial plant, albeit a small one, and it's currently producing the holy grail of renewable energy, baseload renewable power. Um, it's producing that from deep wells, um, which have been drilled between three and four kilometers deep beneath the surface, and they're tapping into this deep underground brine reservoir. So the wells are pumping up this hot brine to the surface. It's coming up hot, 165 degrees centigrade, and it's a brine, so it's salty. Um, 
We produce space load energy from this, Brian has mentioned. What we've been doing for the last few years at our pilot plants here is we've been extracting one of those salts from the brine, lithium chloride, and we've been processing that to produce a battery-grade lithium hydroxide product. And we're now ready to execute to build the commercial version of this. Critically, all of the pieces of the puzzle that we use to make that battery-grade product are in some way, shape, or form used commercially today. We're just bolting them together, and we're engineering the fossil fuels out of the lithium production. So we have zero fossil fuels used in this process. And we actually produce more energy than we consume. Um, so we're net energy positive. Um, so you're looking at our resource, basically. Um, underneath the Upper Rhine Valley, there's this big geothermal uh, lithium brine resource. And this is where we produce our upstream product from. A nice uh, image to get started with. Um, disclaimer is available on our website. I won't go through it. Uh, purpose and mission of the company. Really, we started from zero carbon lithium and work, working backwards from there. How do we decarbonize lithium production? How do we get the fossil fuels and the carbon footprint out of lithium production? Because lithium is actually very carbon intensive today. So um, a ton of lithium hydroxide produced today takes anywhere between 15 and 30 tons CO2 um, per ton of lithium hydroxide produced. If you extrapolate that out to the electric vehicles, um, passenger electric vehicles, converting all of the passenger vehicles in the world to electric over the next few years, which is happening, you will emit somewhere around 2 billion tons of CO2 just for the lithium to do that. That's a massive figure. That's the annual carbon budget of Western Europe. So we want to be a small part of decarbonizing um, the lithium supply chain. I know there's other companies doing great things out there as well to achieve this goal as well. Um, and really, that's the core mission of the company. And once again, you're looking at our mine. Um, which is this, uh, these geothermal wells and plants. Um, our target is to produce renewable heat for around about a million people by 2030 as we expand across the Upper Rhine Valley. Um, and enough lithium hydroxide, this is a very rough figure, but for about a million electric vehicles per annum. And in doing so, to avoid about a million tons of CO2 per annum. So there's a huge avoidance opportunity here. We think we can avoid somewhere between 50 and 60 million tons of carbon dioxide over the life of our projects as we expand. This is a good snapshot of the business here. Um, so at the moment, we're focused on phase one. This is an integrated renewable energy and lithium chemicals operation, producing lithium hydroxide, our trademarked zero carbon lithium product at the, um, at the back end, renewable heats for local communities and industrial customers. And then we have this funnel of future phases that we'll be building across the Upper Rhine Valley. But in addition to being a project developer um, and operator as well, we also have technology in our company. So we have the technology arm of the business. Volzorb is our in-house lithium extraction adsorbent. It's a very high performance one. And we will be looking to license this out across the world as well. We also have our own in-house well delivery group as well, Vercana. A lot of oil and gas expertise in the company. Um, more on that later. Um, very quick summary on, um, because I, I don't have too much time and quite a few slides to get through. Uh, very quick summary on, uh, I guess, the key investment highlights in Vulcan. So we are a unique, a unique offering in the supply chain. So the world's first and only zero carbon lithium company. Um, we have a very large lithium resource, the largest in Europe and globally significant, 27 million tons of contained lithium carbonate equivalent. We have very strong contracts, um, very strong um, uh, uh, relationships with lithium offtakers. So um, we have tier one customers, Stellantis, Volkswagen, LG, Umicore, um, and Renault really supplying um, the top level automakers and battery manufacturers and cathode manufacturers in Europe. Um, we have a low cost of production, um, so very important in a volatile lithium market. On the one hand, we've got offtake prices um, baked in with our agreed offtake agreements. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, a low cost of production as well. Um, we've got very strong tailwinds behind us in Europe. So Europe is really pushing, like other jurisdictions we just heard about in North America, to secure some measure of supply chain independence for critical raw materials. And this is really giving us a strong regulatory tailwind. We have this large development pipeline, as mentioned. It doesn't stop at phase one. We can grow as the lithium market in Europe grows. And we have a very strong management team as well, coming from mostly the oil and gas industry and the chemicals industry in Europe. Um, so very strong industrialization uh, expertise there. We are dual listed, so we're listed in Australia and we're dual listed in Europe as well on the prime standard of the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. 
Um, Stellantis, uh, the automaker, is our second largest shareholder. Um, why do you need lithium in Europe? Well, um, Europe needs a lot of lithium. It needs it very quickly, and it doesn't have any. Um, so there are a few converters being built, um, but there's essentially zero raw material supply coming locally in Europe. And if you're looking at um, what is now considered normal, when I started in lithium, a hard rock mining was actually considered uh, uh, suboptimal compared to Brian's. But um, if you're looking for a hard rock mine in Europe, uh, it's, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to permit. There, I think hopefully some of them will get up and running. Um, but it is uh, socially harder to permit hard rock mines in Europe. Um, also, Europe wants sustainable lithium. They don't just want a lot of lithium. They want sustainable lithium, and they want this um, very quickly. So that's where we come in. We can scale up quickly. Um, we can produce sustainable lithium, and we can reduce reliance on external providers of lithium hydroxide. In addition, we're, we are a renewable energy producer right now, and we're building a lot more renewable energy production. And guess what? There's been an energy crisis in Europe since the invasion of Ukraine. Um, Europe is trying to decarbonize, but it's also trying to get energy security as well as critical raw material security. So we have another product that Europe desperately needs, baseload renewable heat and power. Um, and heating is really the elephant in the room in terms of decarbonization, easier to decarbonize power. This is what we're building. Um, essentially, it's an integrated oil and gas project without the oil and gas. So you've got the, the wells and the pipelines in the upstream pumping that hot brine to the surface, as I mentioned. We've got our geothermal plants on the surface. We're building a larger one nearby. So we'll be producing heat and power from this geothermal plant, as we're doing now. Then we have the lithium plant on the same site, which we're building as part of phase one, um, using the waste heat from this geothermal process to drive that lithium extraction. Then we're producing the salt, which gets transported upstream to our conversion plant in Frankfurt, where we produce the lithium hydroxide. And phase one capacity, 24,000 ton per annum. Each phase after that, the idea is um, the same size. We add further phases of production, but starting with phase one. This is where we are. So this is the Upper Rhine Valley. Um, this is the, uh, the reservoir you can see in, um, in sort of golden orange there. Um, we're starting in the core of the field where we have existing wells, which are pumping this brine to the surface. We're adding more wells. Um, and we're really starting in the, in, in the core of the license area because we have that existing infrastructure. But the, um, the goal is to step out from there. You can see it's a very large field, and we see multiple phases of production ahead of us. And there you see in the downstream, that's where our chemical plant is. So instead of transporting the, um, the lithium chloride for thousands, tens of thousands of kilometers, um, we're 130 kilometers up the road, the upstream and the downstream, very close to each other. Reduces cost, reduces carbon footprint as well. Very well understood system. Um, decades of oil and gas and geothermal production um, which has given us a lot of data and a big head start in the, in the project development. Um, so we have multiple phases ahead of us um, beyond phase one, and this is phase one just in the center as well. So if you cast your mind back to um, that previous page, it really makes up a small fraction of the overall field. So starting with the wells um, and the, the pipelines, you can see once again, very analogous to that um, upstream downstream oil and gas um, style project. And that's why we have a well delivery group in-house, 100 drillers, coming from the oil and gas industry, looking to use their experience to um, build a renewable energy and decarbonization lithium chemicals project. Um, so that's Vekana, our in-house well delivery group. Um, and um, they've been working in this area for, for many, many years, um, drilling oil and gas wells as well as geothermal wells as well. We have two rigs in-house. Um, this is one of them here, which we've been refurbishing for the last couple of years as well. So we have the project execution ability, and we're going to be Drilling really for um, the next decade, we see, as we, as we build further and further phases. The geothermal plant, we're building a bigger version of this one. It's off-the-shelf technology. Um, in terms of the lithium extraction plant, uh, well, this is a, a mini version of it. So we built a commercial demonstration plant. This is about a 40 million euro investment. This is what we call LEOP, lithium extraction optimization plant. This is a training facility. So we'll train our production team here in a pre-commercial environment whilst we're building the commercial plant. We've already done the piloting. That's been done over the last few years. This is the optimization plant. This is the training ground for our production team. So production team is already there. This will start to produce product, um, hopefully, in the next, uh, next couple of weeks. So we're getting very close here to first product um, from this plant. Um, we had a grand opening ceremony uh, late last year, which was well attended. And this is what the, um, the commercial plant looks like. So we'll be building this in an industrial park nearby. Um, we always place ourselves in industrial parks. We're not sort of breaking any 
um, new virgin ground. We're not chopping down any trees. This is all within existing chemical parks and industrial parks. So it once again minimizes the carbon footprint. In terms of the lithium extraction, we're using this. We call it Valsorb. This is technology that has been used commercially since 1996 to take lithium out of brines using a process called adsorption. It was invented by Dow in the 70s. Um, so it's been around for a, a long time. Um, it's older, a lot older than me. Um, we, we use this commercially proven technology. We've adapted it, we've iterated it, and we think our absorbent is one of the highest, if not the highest, performance absorbents in the world. So we do want to um, spec this out as well because we think it's a really good product. But this will be used for our, for our phase one, and we're using a toll manufacturer to make it for us in France, once again, onshoring the supply chain in Europe. Um, so this, the main um, advantages of this process relative to uh, some of the other methods that are used around the world, you, don't, you hardly use any reagents. Um, it's highly selective. It's very, very efficient. You can produce very, very quickly. And the main input is heat. And we have waste heat coming from the geothermal process that we can utilize. And that drives down our cost of production. Um, so this is unique intellectual property, unique IP, and it's in-house to Vulcan. It's a real value that we have. Um, this type of process is used globally today, makes up about 10% of global production, or about a quarter of production coming from brines today. Um, but the rate of adoption is increasing because of the aforementioned reasons. So in places like South America, in China, in North America, increasingly you're seeing adsorption um, style projects being built. So this is the future. The unique advantage that we have, though, is that we have the heat to drive it. You'll see oil and gas majors also getting into the space, including Exxon in the US and Oxy as well. Um, so this is a really interesting space because oil and gas and mining are somewhat intersecting in the world of lithium. The last step of the process, the central lithium plant, same thing again. We built a, um, a commercial demo version. Got that? One and a half minutes to go. Um, we built a commercial demo version. It's going to train the production uh, team. Um, and the, um, we, we've already done the, uh, the groundbreaking ceremony. This is where it is. It's in the Herx Chemical Park, existing chemical park that's been around for over 100 years, um, and essentially using chloralkali technology, electrolysis cells. They've been doing chloralkali here for over 100 years as well. So we have all the expertise, including from, uh, from BASF, to, uh, to run this. Um, I'll, I'm going to have to go through the remaining part very, very quickly. We have a tremendous decarbonization opportunity. You can see the delta there with current supply. But we're also very, very low cost because we're using that waste heat to drive the process. So in a volatile lithium market, I would argue that we represent a safe harbor um, for, um, uh, for lithium production, given that we are very much lowest cost quartile. We also have these tier one um, offtakers that we're selling to as well. So binding lithium hydroxide offtake agreements gives us certainty on pricing. That gives us very attractive economics. Um, so 2.6 billion euro post-tax just for phase one. Remember, this is phase one of multiple phases of operation. This is what we're in the... Um, the mitts now in the trenches of financing. So, um, and you can see it goes from a renewable energy dominant project to a lithium um, dominant project. Um, over 700 million euros of revenues over the project's life on average. We're now in financing, um, and we're really going to be focused on this for um, the majority of the rest of the year. So, we're financing phase one. We've got some good tailwinds there. We just announced backing from the European Investment Bank, um, and we're looking to finance this at a project level, not at a top co level. Um, obviously, to reduce dilution for our shareholders. That is our target. Um, I'll have to stop there. Um, in summary, ready to launch. We are execution ready. We have the execution team in place, the production team in place, nearly 400 employees um, in the company from well delivery to final production. Um, and subject to financing, we are ready to go with zero carbon lithium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francis. Right to the end, but it was worth it. Remember, always go and see them at their booths. Now, this next one is interesting. It's a relatively new player in this sector. Uh, they rang the bell in January this year. They had an oversubscribed IPO, Carly Metals, and they've established a significant lithium exploration package in the Yilgarn and the Pilbara regions of WA, and also over in a place called the Lachlan Ford Belt, which is in New South Wales in Australia. Their focus since listing has been on its Higginsville Lithium District, which is located in a region where the major shareholder, which is Mineral Resources, has built a very strong foothold. Now, this fellow here is Graham Sloan. He is their MD as a previous director at Corora Resources. 
So he's become very well credentialed to this role. He's going to tell us a little bit more about what's happening with Carly's Lithium Project, including, I would suggest, an announcement that was made this morning. So we're going to be the first to hear about that in detail. Would you please make him very welcome? Thank you, Kirsty, for doing such a great job keeping us all in line. I really appreciate it. Also to um, Stewie and the Tribeca gang for putting on this, uh, this uh, conference. Really great effort, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, certainly been a journey for us, uh, been a very interesting journey in a very short space of time. Before I begin, maybe just a quick uh, snapshot of Cali, who we are. We're a, a, a lithium exploration company. Um, we uh, began the journey um, in sort of early January 22, 23, sorry. Um, and in 20, uh, January the 5th of this year, uh, we listed on the IPO. Probably the first, not probably the first uh, IPO listing on the ASX exchange. So we came about by the formation of the, the lithium assets from Kalamazoo Resources and uh, Karora Resources, Karora being a TSX listed company. Uh, Kalamazoo being an ASX listed company. Um, as I said, the journey um, started in uh, early 23. Uh, 24, uh, we listed, we raised some $15 million um, dollars at 25 cents. We were heavily oversubscribed. Um, we opened and closed that offer within a matter of hours. Um, so as I said, uh, um, now we look to put that 15 million to work very quickly. So just quickly on this obligatory disclaimer, urge you to read. Um, really, this is we need something to sort of stand out, make Kelly stand out. What's the one thing or two or three things that are going to get you interested in this Kelly story? Um, well, firstly, we have a massive land position. We have some 4,000 square kilometres of land tied up in three major project areas. Give you an idea of what that means, that's about five times the size of Singapore. So it's a big chunk of land out there and it gives us optionality. Um, two of our three projects are uh, in the hottest lithium provinces in Australia, both in the, in the Pilbara and, and down south in uh, eastern goldfields. Our third project is in over on the east coast in the Lachlan Fold Belt. Um, as I said, uh, following that IPO, we had the funds. We're fully funded for two years of exploration. Um, and pre and post IPO, we had a number of partners and, and uh, key investors. And certainly pre, uh, we had our SQM JV, where they have the opportunity to, uh, to acquire 70% of our two of our three um, Pilbara projects by spending 12 million over four years. So that's, uh, and then post IPO, we we're very fortunate to bring mineral resources onto the register at 14%. And we certainly have the team. We have this great team, both at a board level and also exploration. I know people talk about the, the, the everyone's got a great team, but I'll tell you the secret of, of any successful um, uh, company, and that is that team has to be willing to go out there and put everything on the line to make things happen for the investors. And I believe our board and our executive team certainly have that. Very quickly, a snapshot um, on our, uh, uh, just a corporate view, if you like, 144 million shares on issue, um, market cap of around $60 million, uh, EV of around $46, $45 million. Uh, major shareholders, Karora, who was, the, as I said, uh, partly due to forming uh, Cali, 22%, uh, Kalamazoo, 20%, and then mineral resources with 14%, board and management, have around 11% on a fully diluted basis, uh, and the top 20 own 71% uh, of our register. Board, very solid board, very solid exploration as I, uh, executive team, as I said. Board's led by Luke Reiner, and a lot of people may know Luke in this audience. Um, the three assets themselves, there they are. On the left is our Higginsville, Middle Pilbara, and then Lachlan Fold Belt. Higginsville, as you can see, lots of pretty colors up there divided into eight areas because it's such a very large uh, tenement package. It's some 1,500 square kilometres of tenements. We had to divide that up into eight areas so we can make exploration more efficient, which we've, we only worked on now so far. Two of those projects, one up in the, the top of that up there called Spargoville, and just south of that is our second project area called Widgie Milther. 
That area there, those tenements completely surrounded by existing mines and, and advanced lithium projects. Um, to the north, you have Mount Marion. Uh, to, to over to the east, over here, you have Bald Hill. Down south, Buldania, um, also mineral resources acquired 100% of Pantoro's tenement, uh, lithium rights down here, um, uh, Pioneer Dome. Both uh, Mount Marion and Bald Hill operating processing plants uh, as we speak. The others are certainly well advanced, including up north of uh, uh, Bald Hill being in the manor deposit. So as I said, completely surrounded. We're a bit like Custer as it was in the last stand, surrounded by Indians. And I'm, I'm telling you, this is going to be a great story when we start putting some drills in the ground. And I'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, Pilbara, um, three project areas up there, Doms Hill, Pear Creek, and then Marble Bar. Uh, Doms Hill, Marble Bar, uh, are subject to that SQM JV. Um, surrounded by very good infrastructure, only an hour from Port Hedland. Uh, and the same as here, we have very good infrastructure in and around Higginsville. So when we start talking startup mining and those sort of things, then it's very quickly, very simple process for us to do so. Our third project, emerging province over here in the Lachlan Fold Belt, we have two areas, Gingelic in New South Wales, Talangata in Victoria. Um, again, a big area, 2,000 square kilometres. A bit more on the, on the projects themselves. Well. Higginsville up here, this is our first area we've gone into. Um, we did some surf, surface work, some field work, we rock chips, we've done some soil samples, and we announced sort of uh, around a month ago this very large anomaly, and sitting over the top of that is some big numbers around the rock chips around 5% lithium oxide. The most important thing about this is they coincide uh, sitting on top of this soil anomaly. As uh, Christy pointed out, uh, we've made a couple of, we made an announcement this morning and part of that was in fact to see those anomalies start to expand quite considerably. If I go back to that first one, you can see over here what was just a bullseye, a hotspot over here, very small surface uh, soil program was put over that, lit up. We had some good chip samples here, but now when you start seeing that, you can start to see all up those two anomalies are about five kilometres in length. So these are, we're not talking sort of small size, these are serious sort of uh, targets for us. We'll look to start drilling in early, uh, probably this first half of this year. In fact, given the results of this, we'll bring that drilling on a lot earlier, as soon as we can. Um, again, we'll, we've expanded our soils program to cover this and all the other remaining six, pro, uh, six project areas at Higginsville. At Widgee, another sort of significant anomaly sits there, um, over 900 metres long. Uh, it's only sort of about 20 k's from, from Spargoville, so it's, it's very close. Um, very, again, good numbers, plus 2% rock chips. Again, correlates well with the soils. Mount Henry, early days, 1% um, down there of uh, initial rock chips, so it tells us we're in the right area. Um, Pilbara. As I said before, uh, two of our projects, this one here, this one here, subjected SQMJV. All the money that we raise from that IPO will pre predominantly go into Higginsville um, and a little bit over to the Lachlan Fold Belt. This is fully funded by SQM. So we manage the project, but we are fully funded by SQM for the next uh, couple of years there. They've currently earned around 30% by spending some two and a half million dollars. Um, close to some major mines in there. This is really the land of, what I call the land of the giants. It's the big deposits up here. Um, we've seen Pilgungura up there. We've seen Wajina up there. Uh, you know, sort of 300 and 250 million tonnes, those sort of numbers. So this is big country up here. Uh, and, and we sit dead smack in the middle of it. So looking forward to doing some more work up there. Um, we've done some sort of uh, surface work in and around here. We've done some small uh, drill programs up here. Um, the results of our latest geochem will come out shortly. Um, and some of the field work down here has been along the lines of surface rock chip samples and looking at a lot of those uh, outcropping pegmatites. There's one in particular that goes around 1.2 kilometres long and I think there's about four samples spreading over somewhere between 2 and 2.8 per cent. So looking forward to doing more work up there and, uh, and our geologists, I know our geologists are quite excited. 
Lachlan Foldbelt, as I said, emerging, new province. Um, look, all I can say is that we've been fortunate. We've been in there first with the set, well, sorry, the, with the second company up there. We've been able to pick up a lot of ground up there, over 2,000 square kilometres. That blue area you see up here is recently added to the Jinjalik. It now makes all those boundaries contiguous. Um, we've done some soil work and we've done some rock chips up there. We've certainly seen that there's LCT pegmatites up there. It's now we'll do a bit more soils. We put a hole in there and, and we hit what we think we might hit. And I'm telling you that this is going to be the next lithium hotspot in Australia. We will see a mini rush into this particular area. Um, so still early days, but are hugely exciting for the company. Uh, so look, I'm, I'm very, uh, very, very conscious of Christy. She's got this vicious bump. If I was to step over the mark, I'm going to finish early. Um, I'm going to make sure that uh, I don't get that bump or get bumped off. But the key takeaways to this, as I said to you, there's no other program, no other company in Australia that has the land package we have. It is such a, a big land package. It gives us optionality around exploration. It gives us optionality where we put our people, our best uh, resources. And at the moment, uh, Higginsville appears to take that point, mainly because that's where most of our funding will go. Um, we are well funded, two years fully funded for the next lot of exploration. Um, we have delivered results. We will continue to deliver the results, as you can see from that last ASX announcement. Um, and we have the team. So given those things, the asset, the team and the funds, that's not a bad start. And I think uh, in a very short space of time, I hope to be standing up here, tell you that we've drilled a hole and we've been highly successful and a lot of money to investors' pockets. So thank you very much. Great presentation. Thank you very much, Graham. And impressive that you can keep to time. If you can keep to time there and keep your promises, I'm sure you'll be keeping them all over the place. Uh, Australia to Canada. Next Gen Energy, a Canadian exploration and mining company dedicated to advancing the Rook One project. And I'm going to guess that many of you have heard about this, especially in the last few weeks. Now, that project is poised to deliver 25% of the world's current uranium demand, directly addressing that growing expansion of nuclear energy worldwide and its role in achieving net zero. So the news flow since late last year has been rather prolific and in the last few weeks even more so. So we're going to hear from the team itself. This is Stacey Golican. She is the Director of Investor Relations here in the Asia Pacific Markets. And she's joining us to elaborate on why it is that this company is making so many headlines and should we be interested. Please make her welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so there lies a big opportunity for next gen energy, especially given the growing critical need for uranium against a backdrop of a widening supply demand gap. Now, before we begin, please note that I will be using forward looking information and making forward looking statements throughout this presentation. So as we've all observed, the support for nuclear, particularly over 2023, has been dramatic. There continues to be positive, unrelenting news flow in favour of this energy source, as more governments and industries consider nuclear the solution to the climate crisis and the energy crisis. Geopolitical situations worldwide have also accelerated the path for governments to include nuclear or feature nuclear as a prominent part of its energy diversification and energy security strategy. So demand for nuclear and subsequently uranium is very robust worldwide, but the supply situation grows increasingly precarious. Now, where does NextGen Energy fit into all of this? We are a Canadian uranium exploration and development company. We're triple listed on the TSX, the NYSE and the ASX, and our flagship asset is the Arrow deposit at our Rook One project. Now, Arrow has been described as a geological phenomenon and it has been recognised as the world's largest, lowest cost, high grade uranium deposit under development. Now the project is located in one of the best sovereign locations for developing a uranium mine, the premier mining friendly jurisdiction of Saskatchewan, Canada. NextGen has a significant land package spanning 190,000 hectares in the southwest Athabasca Basin, which is an area known to be super rich in uranium. 
Now, the project is in the final stages of the federal approval process. And once in production, we're going to be able to produce up to 30 million pounds of uranium with our mill permitted for 24 years. Now, 30 million pounds annually is up to 50, well, over 50% of global Western supply and up to 25% of total global uranium supply. Now, to put that into perspective for you, Saudi Arabia, they're responsible for producing 8 to 10% of global oil supply. They're very influential in that market. So when Arrow comes online, we'll be very disruptive and influential in the space. It is a massive project that will help fulfill some of today's supply gap, but it's not going to be enough. So I know a few people have touched on this over this conference, but I think it's important to stress the gravity of the situation. So demand for uranium is expected to increase 127% by 2030 and 200% by 2040. This is a massive increase that the industry cannot meet in time. And, you know, it's a situation that the industry has never seen before with the current state of mine supply having never been more fragile. Many multiples of Rook One's annual production will be required to meet this forecasted supply gap. And that's why projects like Rook One and others must be brought online and into production. And what's driving demand? In December last year, a pretty remarkable thing happened at the COP28 event where we saw 22 countries sign a declaration to triple nuclear capacity by 2050. That number has now grown to 28 and it was the biggest endorsement yet of the role that nuclear energy will play in the energy transition away from fossil fuels. So you'll continue to see many more supportive policies come out of the EU, the US, the UK and Japan. Countries will continue to apply to extend the lifetime on existing reactors, embark upon refurbishments, capacity increases, and then there's demand from the advent of small modular reactors. Worldwide, there's currently 60 reactors being built in over 17 countries, a further 110 are planned. That number also does include India's latest news where they've said they're gonna add a further 18 nuclear builds to their nuclear build-out program. So the demand from these emerging economies alone is enough to keep this market really tight till the end of the decade. We are in a period of significant nuclear investment with no signs of slowing down. On the supply side, supply is entering a challenging period for the foreseeable future. Post Fukushima, there has been massive underinvestment in exploration and mine development all the way up until 2020, which really wasn't that long ago. Restarting idle mines are proving challenging because the cost to produce a pound has increased. Uh, major producers are supply constrained. There's scarcity of new mine supply, long lead times on greenfield projects due to the complexity of permitting a uranium mine. And then you've also got geopolitical issues, the Russian uranium import ban that's looming in the background, the bifurcation of markets as more people seek for diversified Western supply. Now, next gen, because of our technical setting, we have extremely low costs. And as a result of our technical setting, we're able to flex production up and down in line with market conditions. This means that we are able to and will use volume-based contracting referencing spot prices at the time of delivery. This approach will maximize the dollar received on every pound produced. And this approach will be new to the industry and will provide transparency uh, and promote resiliency of the uranium uh, supply chain. So I mentioned our low cost before, we have a low all-in sustaining cost of US sub $11. Now, based on the 2021 feasibility study, at a spot price of US $100 a pound, we'll generate some pretty compelling economics. We will generate $8 billion NPV Canadian, over $2 billion in free cash flow, a sub 82% IRR, and a very quick payback period of less than a year. So some really incredible numbers here. Now, because of our low costs, we go into production under any pricing cycle, and we're highly cash generative in all pricing environments. Even if you do not agree with the spot price trajectory, we will still be making billion dollar NPVs and billion dollar EBITDAs, as we've got great downside protection from our low cost profile. So, as for our expansion potential, note that the darker green bars here cover our measured and indicated, that's in our feasibility study, of 260 million pounds at 3.1% grades. 
Over 60% of our measured and indicated is at 17% grades, which is 170 times the global average. The lighter green area on this graph represent our 81 million in inferred resources, which are around 1% grades, and adding value through our drill bit. So earlier this year, we announced our 2024 exploration program, where we said we'd drill 30,000 metres with the objective of finding new arrow-like discoveries. And a couple of weeks ago, we released a pretty exciting news release where we hit intense new uranium mineralization three and a half kilometers away from Arrow. And while it's still early days, it's looking like the results of that extremely promising with double digit grades. So 30, pounds of, 30 million pounds of uranium a year. What does that mean from an environmental ESG perspective? That's enough to power 46 million homes. That's all the, a third of the homes in the US. So that's all the homes in uh, Florida, Texas, Pennsylvania, New York, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. And um, we'll, all, we'll, we'll do that by also removing 70 million car equivalents of CO2 a year. So that's over 300 million tons of CO2 avoided annually. It is an amazing project, and to the best of my knowledge, no other resource project will be as impactful as RUG1. So where are we at with our approval process? Well, last year in November, NextGen re received their Provincial Environmental Assessment Approval. This is huge because we're the first greenfield uranium project to have reached this major regulatory milestone decision in Saskatchewan since the 1990s. We're the first greenfield project to have been approved that is 100% independently owned, non-government owned. And it's also one of the most efficient approvals with respect to cost and time. Now that we have our provincial environmental assessment approval, we are laser focused on acquiring the federal approvals required for the project. And we will have an update on that this year. Now, our project also has industry-leading impact benefit agreements signed with all of the Indigenous communities local to the project site. This is unheard of in mining, and it's something that the team is so incredibly proud of having built. And as a further testament to the trust and collaboration built by the team, Indigenous leaders from these groups have also been proactively advocating for our project in the Federal Government of Canada and the Saskatchewan Parliament. That is also unheard of in mining. So, at a $100 spot price, based on free cash flow, we will generate $1.6 billion US. That will place us in the top 10 mining companies of the world. Now, we think that the spot price will move beyond $150 a pound. And if we look at the last spot price run in the 2000s, it hit a high of $135, $140 a pound, which in today's dollars equates to about $200 a pound. Now, the difference between back then and now is that a lot of the major producers back then are either no longer in existence or they're already supply constrained. And so beyond $150 spot price, we'll be in the top five mining companies of the world. As for our capital structure, we currently have 410 million cash on hand, with the exception of some G&A items. Um, every dollar spent going forward will be on project capex and working capital. Now, in terms of financing, we have several expressions of interest, um, totaling about US $1.25 billion from uh, uh, traditional lenders, international lenders, and export credit agencies that are all very motivated to invest in a elite ESG project. As for our executive and leadership team, uh, they're very experienced and entrepreneurial, and it's not just our leadership team that are really determined, that determination flows through the whole team, the whole company, and as a result of our collective culture, process and execution, we have achieved one of the most efficient approvals with respect to cost and time. Again, we have a highly credible board with deep expertise through a dozen subject matters, and with their guidance, we're well placed to navigate the dynamics of the uranium market sector while safeguarding the interests of our stakeholders and shareholders alike. So I've shared a lot with all of you today. It's going to be a very busy year for next gen for 2024 as we look to establish our federal approvals hearing date, complete our site infrastructure program, award our shaft sinking contracts, commence major construction, all while in parallel running our 2024 exploration program. I thank you so much for your interest and your time. And if you have any questions, please find me around the conference. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Right. Is anyone else having any issues with the Wi-Fi at all for the Future Facing Commodities site at all? You all okay? I just want to check in because we're having a few. And if you have, please give us some feedback and we can fix it up for you. Wayne Hiley. Here it comes. Right. So as the world embraces this uh, nuclear power for a clean energy future, it becomes increasingly apparent that we need to source uranium from tier one mining jurisdictions. Uh, and Peninsula Energy, who's coming up on stage now, operates a world-class, long-life, low-cost asset, which is based in Wyoming in the USA. So this is their company CEO and MD. And Wayne has committed the last 35 years of his career to process innovations in the uranium industry. He holds or has held numerous engineering, management, and executive uh, positions. And today he's going to tell us all about the future for Peninsula Energy and inspire you to perhaps jump on board. Welcome, sir. Thank you. I'd like to, to start off by saying, I think if, if you're gonna have a great uranium development project, you need to have a weapon-based um, name. We just heard about Arrow, and I'm gonna tell you about Lance and our other project, Dagger. So we are in good shape here. Um, Peninsula Energy has, uh, or is on track now to become a, a uranium producer at the end of this year in a world-class uh, tier one jurisdiction, the state of Wyoming. We're an ASX listed company uh, with US based assets and uh, it's very, uh, very pleased to be here today presenting to you. Again, uh, all the disclaimers are standard. Uh, I do tend to speak with forward looking statements and I caution you on that. Uh, today, uh, what we're looking at with Peninsula Energy and the Lance projects is a world-class uh, scalable near-term uranium production story in a tier one jurisdiction. We are on track uh, for, for uh, production at the end of 2024, and we funded that. Um, we're funded to production. Uh, we'll be looking over the course of this year to secure additional funding to take us from uh, and through the ramp up phase to the point of, of being cash flow positive, which to me is a mark of a mature a uranium uh, uh, company or any company being cash flow positive, producing enough product to support all of your activities and, and providing a return for your shareholders. Uh, we know, uh, you know with certainty that we're facing a, a very favorable uranium market uh, now, and, and it looks to be that way in, well into the future. Uh, and with that, uh, our developments at Lance are are uh, providing us multiple avenues of growth, uh, exciting opportunities to expand the resources uh, within the Lance projects at the Kendrick and the Barber areas, and then, and then at our Dagger project, which is adjacent. Uh, today, our corporate uh, situation is, is like this. Our, our um, market cap sits at about $253 million Australian. Um, we have about $58 million US in the bank today. We're well funded for our programs and we have no term debt. A uh, very experienced board of directors who's been with the company for a long time. And, and we also have a very experienced management team. But to answer the question, how do we come to be so well funded to have $58 million in the bank today? Uh, what we did was we just completed a, an equity capital raising in, in November of 2023. Uh, with that capital raising, we did a placement of $50 million Australian, and that was followed with a share purchase plan for our existing shareholders, taking good care of them, um, a $10 million raising. Attached to those uh, shares was, was uh, options, half options, and those half options are in the money with a strike price of $0.10 cents, uh, per share. Uh, they have a short dated um, tenure that uh, the options expire within a year, and that was all designed so that uh, we could uh, possibly see another $40 million of revenue from the option exercise over the course of the next year that will continue to bring funding into our company. We're also pursuing uh, loan programs. Uh, we, we have a loan application being considered by the U.S. Department of Energy uh, that would, would provide additional funding for the company and carry us through the ramp up period of production. Uh, and we're talking to other um, non-bank uh, debt providers as, as other options for funding. So we're not excluding equity, but we're looking at uh, debt um, funding for the balance of our, our capital needs. That's our priority. Um, our, our production team is second to none in the United States. 
uh, as introduced, I have over 35 years of experience in the uranium production industry in the U.S. Um, I'm second to Mr. Ralph Canode, who's my project manager at the, at the facility. He has 45 years of experience. Collectively, you know, with, with some of the younger guys, each having over 20 years of experience, this team that we have in place has over 200 years of direct production, construction, and operations uh, experience in uranium mining, and, and we are the envy. This team in the United States is, is just one of the top uranium production teams, so I'm really pleased to be working with them, and I know that <clears throat> they will successfully carry the project forward into production in the, in the coming year. Let's talk about the project. It's situated in the state of Wyoming. The last project is in, in the Powder River Basin, which is a prolific uranium production district. You can see on this map the number of uranium uh, mines and development projects in the Powder River Basin and around the state of Wyoming. Wyoming is a mining state, in case you didn't know, leading the nation with coal production, uranium production, trona, uh, and one of the leading uh, producers of oil and gas in the United States. The people of Wyoming understand extraction, they support the extraction industry, and we really have virtually no um, local opposition when we do our regulatory work. Um, that means that the, the Lance projects are fully licensed for production. We've had our license since 2015, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the history of it, but the Lance projects have broken down into three areas. The red area that you see here is the Ross production area. That's where we started production in 2016. Uh, we have two de fully developed well fields that will return back into production when we get going again. We have a process plant that we're expanding today. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in, the, in this presentation. And um, then we're gonna look to, to expand our production out into the Kendrick area, the area in blue. The Kendrick area has about 16 million pounds of uranium resource to add to the about seven million pounds that are at, uh, still at Ross today. Uh, between those two areas, we project uh, 10 years of mining. Uh, the next 10 years will produce over 15 million pounds just between Ross and Kendrick. And then we have the most exciting aspect you know, for explorationists is the, is the Barber area, the, the area in green. Today we know there's over 32 million pounds of resource. It's mostly inferred resources and that we have a lot of work to do to infill, drill, and bring closer space drilling to the project area. We know that there's a, a tremendous resource expansion opportunity there, but you know, today we sit with a, a, a world-class um, project in the United States with over 50 million pounds of resource. Uh, when, we, when we continue drilling on the, on the project, we think we can bring that resource up, very much a forward-looking statement, to between 150 and 200 million pounds. Again, making this one of the most exciting and most substantial uranium project developments in, in, in the United States. We use and employ a, a low pH in situ recovery process. Uh, in other words, uh, acid leaching with, it, with solution mining. This is how the Kazakhs and Australians produce their uranium um, by in situ methods. It's very well understood, uh, ecologically friendly approach to uranium recovery. Uh, we do. Uh, we only have temporary surface disturbances. Uh, we add a chemically fortified solution into an aquifer that dissolves the uranium. We recover that solution and then the uranium from that solution at our process plants. It's a very simple, elegant uh, mining process. It does not require us to move ore. We don't have open pit or underground mining facilities. This is what our mine looks like in the, in the, the picture on your left. Um, the in situ well field. Each of the little black dots you see in that field is, is uh, a cover over a production or an injection well. But that's what our mine looks like when it's operating. Inside the plant facility, we have ion exchange columns. They look like this. Um, we're expanding our ion exchange system now. Um, again, this project was licensed and developed uh, in 2015. We have a capacity or, or a permit to produce up to 3 million pounds per year and it was operated from 2016 until the middle of 2019 when the uranium markets did not support the project at that time. Today, the projects are quite different, or the economics uh, and, and uranium markets are quite different, and we're happy to be moving forward with, de um, with development activities again, transitioning to the low pH chemistry, which was completed in 2023, um, but more importantly, 
Um, you know, when you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. So we're bringing some of the additional processing in in-house. We're, we're preparing our plant facility so that we can do the elution precipitation and final dry yellow cake processing so that we produce a final dry yellow cake. In the past, we relied on a third party to do that work for us. So part of our plan and, and really the focal point of our plan in 2024 is to build the new plant facilities so that we can produce a finished product ourselves in-house. Uh, and so we have construction going on. That's the exciting thing. Uh, you see in the upper picture here, um, folks uh, a week and a half ago putting up forms for, for pouring concrete. Uh, I'm told that tomorrow we'll be pouring a significant amount of concrete slabs for our, our future facilities. Um, you know, we completed the low pH transition work. You see the acid storage and, and distribution facilities in the lower picture and some of the reworking of the plumbing inside the existing plant to be compatible with low pH. Uh, we'll be commencing the significant part of our, our, uh, our construction project in the coming weeks. We have the, the bid process out for the construction companies right now to uh, build the, the plant facility. We expect to select a contractor in, in the uh, coming week or two, and then we'll be off and running constructing the project. Uh, while we do the plant and, and, and the plant construction as maybe the focal point of the, of the year, we're also constructing new well fields and getting new well field areas ready for production so that in 2025 we can have a very robust production profile. Um, preparing new well fields in an in-situ recovery facility is like stripping topsoil and overburden in an open pit mine. You have to get your mine areas ready for production. We have a, a high degree of focus on that this year. We're spending an equal amount of money on well field development as we are on plant construction. So, you know, the work programs this year are very significant, but 2025 will be a real exciting year. This is what our timeline to production looks like. Um, you know, today we're getting ready to select our construction contractor. We expect construction to start in, in a couple of weeks, as, you know, directly after selecting the contractor. Uh, we do have some, some pre-construction activities going on now, as I showed you. We have resource expansion drilling plans for this year as well in, in the Lance um, project area and also at our Barber project, which is just to the north uh, east of Lance. And, and we're going to continue to prepare to ramp up production. Uh, we think pre-production flow and operational activities will start in the third quarter as a plant construction nears completion. And we expect to be in production around the end of this year. Uh, first delivery of dry yellow cake from our new and expanded facility will happen in the second quarter of 2025 and we'll have project uh, the project uh, achieving sustainable free cash flow in the third quarter of 2025. So it's just around the corner for us. We have a lot of work in the pro or, or in pro work programs and action right now, very active site over 45 employees working and and uh, numerous contractors. Our all in sustaining costs when we're up and running has been projected to be around $42.5 a pound. Um, we think an average realized price of $67 a pound is realistic. The market has improved and we'll see a better uh, average realized price on the basis of the improved market. But this is exciting economics for us, justified production. Um, we, this is the production profile that we look at for the next 10 years. Uh, next year, 2025, we think we'll be producing about a million pounds, 1.1 million pounds, and then we're going to ramp this up to about a 2 million pound a year um, production rate over the by the end of the decade. This reflects the first 10 years of production. Uh, we'll, we'll expand into the Barber area. You know, again, this was just the Ross and Kendrick areas. And when we expand into the Barber area, this won't be a 10 year mine life. It'll be a 20 or 25 year mine life. It's a very significant uranium resource. Um, we have offtake contracts. Uh, we have committed some sales into the next uh, 10 years. So against that production profile, this is our sales profile. Um, in the dark green bars, you can see how much product is, is committed into sales agreements. This gives us certainty of pricing, uh, but you can also see how much uh, additional production is available for sale. The, the gray bar on top of the darker green bars uh, show what's available for sale into the market. So we have very strong leverage 
uh, to, to the upward uh, trajectory of the uranium price. But at the same time, we have very good certainty on, on um, known revenues from contracts. We have six customers, utility customers in both the United States and Europe supporting our project. So we're an emerging near-term producer, exciting news flow this year, uh, initiation of plant construction, development activities in the well fields, and most importantly, the start of production at the end of this year. So I hope you'll uh, follow us and, and see how we achieve this. Thank you. Right on, Thank you very much, Mr. Hardy. Look forward to going out and having a chat with you more about that one in detail. Uranium certainly been the flavor of the month, go that way. <laughs> We've got this black hole at the back of our stage and I'm fearful that I will lose one of the presenters at one point in time over the next few days. Ah, you're over there, sir. Come and join us on stage. This is James Posnay, everyone. Well-respected gentleman, uh, General Manager of Listings with the ASX Limited. That as you're making your way up, I just wanted to point out to people because lunch was so delicious yesterday that a lot of us came in very, very slowly after lunch. So today I'd like to suggest that you grab your dessert and bring it in here and enjoy it because we have a really interesting talk straight after lunch. I've got the team from Fortescue in and they're going to talk not just about mining but also technology and development and they've got a world first to announce that I'm sure you'd like to hear more about. So that's coming up straight after lunch and to find out about it you have to bring your dessert in and you can sit and listen. So James, Big career, lots of things going on for you, but today you're going to use all of those years of knowledge that you have, that you've had accumulated, and you're going to talk to us about the ASX, APAX Globally Connected Stock Exchange, and you have 15 minutes to regale us and inform us. Please make him welcome, everyone. Great. Thank, thank you very much, and um, thank you to Rebecca for the opportunity to uh, speak today. Uh, it's wonderful to be back in Singapore. Uh, we make the trip up here for various reasons, um, and this is a very good, good reason to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today about the ASX market, um, what it looks like in the global context, global capital markets context, uh, and then also talk about why it's the leading stock exchange for resources and mining. So first of all, um, it's quite an active market. So ASX is, uh, is quite active in terms of capital raisings. Um, importantly, in terms of number of listings, we do about 120 a year, um, which puts us sort of in the top 10 uh, exchanges by volume. Uh, we also have a long history of supporting junior mining companies. I mean, we listed BHP 140 years ago, where we've listed lots of junior mining companies and larger mining companies ever since. So it's got a long history of supporting early stage companies, and that's also translated into other sectors like uh, technology and uh, healthcare over the years as well. We have robust regulation uh, in Australia. Um, it, I would say it's not as burdensome as some major markets like the US, um, but we don't have a junior market model either. We have a main board only. Um, so it's robust but balanced uh, regulation. Got 2,000 listed companies, about 230 of those are foreign companies, actually, as well. So, you know, roughly sort of 10% or so uh, cross-border companies listed on ASX. And it's a liquid market, $8 billion uh, traded daily, um, which translates to roughly sort of 80% of the market is turned over by market cap in any one year. Um, and most importantly, uh, we have the fifth biggest pension market globally in Australia. So it's about $3, uh, $3 trillion under management currently, uh, and is projected to grow, uh, as this slide will show, to uh, $9 trillion by 2041. Now, this is an incredible asset to have as a country. It provides extremely strong tailwinds uh, for the equity market, uh, and will continue to, continue to do so. The other feature of this is we have the highest allocation to equities of any pension market of any country. So it's about 51% of all of the assets under management allocated to equities. So again, that really supports um, listings. It was a quiet year last year globally for IPOs. Um, so 120 on average we get per year. We had 45 last year. Um, but that was also the case globally because of the macro economic conditions. Uh, we do definitely see the IPO market coming back though, certainly in the, uh, the set towards the second half of this year uh, and then into, into next year. Um, 
And but more importantly, I would say in terms of capital raisings, ASX is number one in the world for follow on offerings by volume and has been for the last six consecutive years. So this is not always that well known. Um, and in terms of value uh, raised through follow on offerings, we're more than double Toronto um, on average, um, just a little shade under double for last year, um, but also ahead of Hong Kong for follow on offerings and capital raisings. You know, so we're really quite proud of this. And this is actually two things. On the demand side, obviously, you've got the assets under management in Australia, the large pension market and so on, giving those tailwinds for the demand side locally. We also have international investors as well. But on the other side of the coin, it's more about the settings. So we have some very accommodating settings for follow on offerings. So for example, if you run a placement, um, you can place with institutions and sophisticated investors up to 15% of your share, cap share capital uh, in any one year. And you can do so without shareholder approval, raise the money within 48 hours. So it's an extremely flexible, uh, low doc offering uh, method. And you can, can use that as a listed company on ASX. So for those two reasons, that really helps us become uh, world leading in follow on offerings. Another important aspect of being listed, of course, is liquidity. Uh, now, driving liquidity is index inclusion. So if you, if you get into the S&P, ASX indices, that helps enormously in terms of having that passive investment, but also the active investment that is benchmarking those indices. Now, Australia has a much lower threshold to get into the major indices. So our blue chip index, the ASX 200, has an entry point, and this is US dollars for comparison reasons, uh, of $730 million. Uh, the ASX uh, 300, which is um, $372 million, is also a very well-tracked index in Australia. Now, the equivalent blue chip indices overseas have much higher thresholds. Um, so you have to be a much larger company before you're attracting that investment. Um, and so what we see in Australia is that you're, you're getting access much earlier to that global investment. And that goes on to the second point here, which is we have a lot of international investment on ASX. So um, in terms of the overall um, institutional ownership, it's about 54% Australian, so domestic ownership uh, of institutions. But the rest um, is from overseas. So about 25%, for example, comes from uh, the United States. There's also a good balance between institutional retail investors. So it's about sort of 70% institutional investment, um, you know, 30% retail across the market as a whole. We've got a good track record in most, uh, or really all uh, industry sectors. Uh, resources are, is our most dominant in terms of market cap and uh, number of listings. Uh, we've also got some very big banks uh, listed, but we, we have a long tail of uh, smaller companies that are emerging in, in all sectors uh, and an emerging uh, technology sector as well. So we've got some really interesting sort of billion dollar plus uh, tech companies uh, listed on ASX, uh, and also a sort of world-class uh, peer group of healthcare companies as well. So the market overall is about sort of $3 trillion um, in total. Now, if I just go uh, drill down a bit more into um, the resources sector as a whole. So resources here, we're showing metals and mining, and then energy uh, on, on the other hand. Um, the, the largest bulk of the resources sector by market cap on ASX is metals and mining, but we also have some decent and large uh, companies in the energy sector, oil and gas sector as well. Overall, it's 900, over 900 companies in this space. So plenty of um, options as an investor, a large menu of investment opportunities. Those key names, um, the larger companies listed, you'll be well aware of. So BHP obviously being the flagship um, company listed on ASX, but of course, a long tail of smaller opportunities as well. And of those 900 companies, they, they actually are based or have operations in 96 different countries. So it really is truly a global industry listed on ASX. There have been some interesting new listings um, recently. We've had, even though IPOs have been a little quieter um, than usual, we've had some really interesting dual listings, um, either as a result of M&A or just looking for incremental access to investors on ASX. So Newmont acquired Newcrest uh, and listed at the end of the last year. Um, that's actually listed in the US, of course, as well. Um, 
Arcadium, lithium, um, or, or arcadium uh, was basically uh, all chem and livent combination. So it's a, a, a New York listed company, ASX listed company that combined together and dual listed on, on the US side and, and on ASX. Uh, and then we've had a couple of really interesting copper listings. So capstone copper listed in, in Canada, uh, dual listed just uh, last month. Uh, and then metals, metals acquisition core as well, uh, dual listed. Um, and actually raised money at the same time. So effectively did another uh, IPO in, in, in effect uh, on ASX, even though it was already listed in New York first. And next year, and you heard from uh, just a couple of presentations ago, has been a very successful uh, uranium listing uh, over time, uh, listed back in 2021. In terms of the performance, uh, there'll be no surprise to you that so um, the metals and mining sector has outperformed resources as a whole um, over the last 10 years. The last 10 years has been more challenging in the performance of fossil fuel stocks. Um, and, and that just goes to the theme of this whole conference. Um, so metals and mining, you know, obviously a very high level has outperformed um, resources as a whole, but resources has also nevertheless outperform the broader index in Australia, so the ASX 200. Um, and the top line there, which is quite a dramatic increase over the last 10 years, are gold stocks. Uh, and again, that obviously, obviously um, reflects the, uh, the gold price over time. In terms of capital raise, we actually raise capital through the cycle. So if we combine secondary and capital raise and IPO capital raise, it's about 12 and a half billion on average has been um, raised every single uh, year um, for the last 10 years. Um, so that's continuing to be quite strong. So even though, like I say, IPOs have been a little quiet, the secondary capital raisings are extremely important, of course, to grow existing listings. And there's been some good take up of those uh, placements, rights issues and, and share purchase plans uh, over that time. If I go a little bit more into uh, metals and mining specifically, um, I think this is a really important slide. I wanted to just show you in context where ASX sits compared to other competing exchanges around the world. So if we look at those competing exchanges, I'll start with the sort of top section, which is like, what does a market look like right now? Um, so just in metals and mining, over 770 uh, listed companies. Um, we've got the number one in terms of size market cap globally of any exchange. And we're sort of head and shoulders above the rest in that sense. Um, and actually, even more so in terms of capital raising and IPO activity. So the, the section below is actually, over the last three years, what we've seen in IPOs and capital raisings. So you can see 185 uh, IPOs in that period on ASX, just in metals and mining, which is way ahead of any other stock exchange globally in those three years. You can also see in terms of capital raise, this is US dollars again for comparison about $2 billion uh, in capital raising just IPOs over that period. And so we're number one, both in terms of those IPOs, but also in terms of number and capital raised in follow-on offerings as well. So that's a really important slide. And quite honestly, I was a little surprised when we, we put this together, just how far ahead of the other exchanges we currently are. Um, so that just bodes well, both in terms of, if you're thinking about listing, as a company, it's a great place to list and raise capital, but also in terms of an investor, um, the menu of investment opportunities is very long and very wide. In terms of listed companies, we also support them post listing, of course, as a stock exchange, that's really important. We run various programs for our listed companies in terms of investor engagement. Um, and we also have a sort of thought leadership pieces and education on various policy and rule changes over time um, and run those sessions with, with our listed companies to help them keep, keep ahead of the curve in terms of developments on that, on that side as well. Uh, and then we also run an equity research scheme, which is subsidized research for smaller companies, for small cap companies, where we subsidize brokers to, uh, to cover those stocks. Um, and we found that over time that's helped stimulate further research uh, in those names. So to sum up, um, ASX has enormous tailwinds and it is in a very privileged position to have a very large pension market um, that continues to support the equity market over time and will, will, will continue to do so in increasingly so. Um, we have the world's uh, most significant and important metals and mining sector 
of any stock exchange, whether you're thinking about size or capital raising activity. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, as I mentioned, for um, investors, it's really important because they have a continuing, expanding uh, menu of investment opportunities in the sector as well. Uh, we expect that to accelerate um, as time moves on as we go through the second half of this year, as I mentioned, and then into, uh, into next calendar year. We have four uh, members of the team at the conference, so uh, please come and find us, and uh, we're very happy to talk to you further. And if you'd like a copy of this presentation, we have the QR code right here, um, so please feel free to, to scan um, and, and have that um, at your fingertips. Um, so with that, I'll close. Um, thank you very, very much for uh, listening, and enjoy the rest of the conference. That is a brilliant innovation to put that up the end there too. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right, Tim, we're going to take a break. I'd say I've got on my program that we're coming back at 1 p.m. So you've got 45 minutes up your sleeve today to enjoy your lunch. But please make sure you come in and hear that presentation from Fortescue because I think it will blow your mind, quite frankly, as to what they've managed to achieve. It'll certainly change the future for um, transporting our commodities around the globe. Enjoy, and we'll see you back soon. Thank you.